Is it going? Yep. All right, mini car. Do I hear it? Yes, I do. I would like to call to order the May 23rd, 2023, Columbia Borough Council meeting. Can I have a roll call, please? Council President Zink. Here. Council Person Kaufman. Here. Council Person Stahl. Here. Council Person Fisher. Here. Council Person Price. Here. Council Person Lintner. Here. Council Person Burghardt. Here. Mayor Lutz. Here. Thank you. Great. Would anybody like to offer uh, invocation? No? Um, if you would like, please. Oh, all right. Thank you. Shall we balance? <laughs> This meeting, thank you for the leadership of our bell, to those who protect, who provide, who guide, who envision, those who uh, you cherish uh, along the way. We ask your blessings upon the business at hand. We pray that all things be done in love and order. Thank you for coming. Thank you for how you bless us. Thank you for what you do for us. Thank you for our first providers and those who provide health needs and food and shelter even to our homes. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in our barrel. And now, guide our meeting. Give us your presence, your wisdom, and your power. And we will give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Item 12 B and C, um, the amount of the offer amount for both of those has changed, and um, our realtor is here to present those offers to us um, before we make a decision. So, are there any other additions, deletions, or reorganization of the agenda needed? No. But I have a motion to approve the reorganized agenda. I have a motion by Council Person Lindner, second by Council Person Price, to approve the amended agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. Um, presentation and acceptance of reports. I would like to acknowledge the finance reports for April 2023. Um, just note the, uh, as expected, the high percentage of property taxes has been received, so that's why our um, revenue looks to be a higher percentage. And did you see? <laughs> um, yeah. So there's that. Did I miss the minutes? Oh, oops. oh, I put this in the wrong place. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, I missed citizen comment. Oh my goodness. I am so sorry. Um, Citizen comment, non-agenda items only. Um, the first three signs are about the garden. So 
I'm going to forego those unless there's other non-agenda comments. Um, and then, so then we have Frank Gautrick. Yeah, there were three, and I said, they all say that they're for the garden, and that's the presentation, so. Uh, you know, folks, not too long ago, I remember attending meetings that I believe the big chief from Elizabeth Town was there pushing to get a resource officer. And it was stated that it, was, it needed so bad. And my understanding was that when we did get one, it was very good. Now my understanding is they don't have a resource officer. And can somebody run me through this why they don't have them? Do you want me to? Because the, uh, we were, after uh, Officer Engel uh, left, we, after he was gone, we had spoken to the school, and it was just mutually decided between us and the school district that rather than do an SRO position, they were changing it to a CSO, a Community Safety Officer. Isn't that what it's after? And uh, the school district and Jack had gone to several different school districts to learn about that, and they came up with the contract for the Community Safety Officer. Um, so that's what we cur that's the what we currently have in place. We did hire one at the beginning of the year. He resigned shortly after he was hired. We hired another one as soon as we could. He recently resigned too. He was there for what? Two months? Yeah, three, three, four months. Three months. And he resigned. So now we're advertising for another one. Um, but that's why they don't have one because we've not we're not even able to attract officers, much less the CSO. And actually, Frank, today we conducted our first interviews, first interview phase of uh, some candidates. So we expect within the next few weeks or months, we'll have another CSO for the school. The two officers that resigned, did they resign the resource officer or did they resign the force? The whole CSO position. So they're not with the force of correct? No, they were officers. They would only be here during times when school was out of session, and the times that they were working not, did not overlap with to be here at the borough at all. So they were civilian employees. They were not sworn law enforcement. Well, that was my understanding at the beginning. My understanding there, there were officers that that was going to be resource officers, and then when that term was done for the summer, they worked as an officer as a police force. Yeah, we apologize for the misunderstanding, but we uh, clearly explained they were not sworn officers. Uh, and during the summer months, you are correct, uh, they will work uh, as CSAs for us, uh, but they will not investigate crimes, they will not make arrests. So they will respond to uh, you know any of the needs of the residents and support law enforcement officers. Okay, please. So. We probably won't have, if you don't interview, we probably won't have one until school resumes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, sir. All right, next one that we have is Mike Flannery. Agenda items. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah well, that's what we allow the comments during the agenda items. That way you can comment before we make our decision. All right. Back on track. Minutes for approval. But I have a motion to approve the minutes. Um, of the Borough Council meeting from May 9th, 2023. Sorry. I have a motion by Council Person Kaufman, second by Council Person Stahl to approve the Borough Council meeting minutes for May 9th, 2023. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? See, that's why I, I skipped it because the first motion wasn't Eric and Peter. <laughs> 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 Are you ready? 
Are there any questions on the finance report from April 2023? I have one on the slide of the revenue side. Did we not, on this slide, did we not still get the RAC P? No, we did not get that yet. Oh, okay. No. The RAC P, yeah, we're still in the process. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, hopefully by the end of this year, even my fingers crossed, it's not pass. Any other um, questions or comments on the finance reports? Next, uh, presentation, a perfect gift, community garden. I'm just glad you're talking into the microphone because that's, you know, that's key. And it is key. Um, hey, everybody, I'm Jasmine. I just want to thank Columbia Borough for allowing me to be here, Mayor Looks and uh, Mr. Mark. Um, I had a presentation, but my presentation, as we know, technology fails us sometimes. So if you're interested in the presentation, I can gather your emails later and we can go from there. But again, my name is Jasmine Kelly and I am the CEO and spearhead of, of a perfect gift. We're rooted together, driven by purpose, okay? Our mission is, before I even get there, I'm Jasmine. I'm from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I came here when I graduated from Louisville University with a social work degree. After that, I have became a birth doula, so I help, if you don't know what a birth doula is, is I help um, women give birth. So provide support emotionally, physically, and educationally as they give birth to help them have a successful birth. In addition to that, I am a child educator, and this is the reason why I am starting a project called the Elmo Mulberry Community Garden. Somebody say, what's a community garden, Jazz? What's a community garden? Oh, Jazz. Thank you, I love when people interact. Um, not as professional, but I love when people interact with me. Um, our community garden is going to be an initiative to basically create an alternative food support system linking farmers, businessmen, and women with community members um, in nuclear places in the community to help relieve um, and create relief stress of food insecurity. <laughs> Our community garden is located at 520 Concord Lane. If you're interested, you can come out and visit us. Um, again, we value cross-cultural relationships. So building relationships between different ethnic groups and ethnic culture backgrounds and stuff really helps us as a community thrive. It doesn't take one person or one um, only one gender, one, one race, but it takes all of us working collectively to make an impact. As well as that, collaborative efforts help create relief in other areas so that people might have answers to some questions you might know, not know, and they might um, have answers to things that you do know. Do know. Okay. Um, so we have started this project. We have started the beginning of this project last year, coming up with this project. Over the past year, we have really hit the ground running, running. Again, we are still in infant stage, so our infant stage looks as to have 12 garden beds. We plan to expand and go to different areas and place gardens in different places, but just to help relieve the food um, insecurity. So my plan is to connect with different doulas, connect with women who are birthing, connect with hospitals, connect with doctors. That's what we're in the process of doing, connecting with doctors to help combat health disparities and wellness-related issues. A lot of the issues start within our body and what we intake, the hormones we intake, and the stuff. So again, I'm a doula, so if I start at birth, I'm going to eat stuff that has vitamin C, you know, potatoes, tomatoes, beans, all those things to help us to later on in life. We also focus on our senior community, help them live a sustainable life. In addition, we provide relationships and provide opportunity, business opportunities for people to develop. So we'll have come out and build a garden bed. We will have come learn what's in the community, have different businesses talk about what they have and what they have to offer to create and sustain our community that we have in Columbia. This project is a partnership between a perfect gift, Ashley Tabernacle Church of God in Christ, Penn State Extensions, Willisville University, and the Black Church Food Security Network. We together are working to make an impact. Um, in the community, Millersville University has gave us some money and gave us interns to help with this project 
and Pennsylvania Extension will be providing educational resources, providing educational events and seminars for us to learn like canning, how to properly clean, can and preserve, and we're going to be doing that in partnership with the local farmers and local businessmen and women um, in Columbia. So in the sum of the whole, we need your help or we would like your help. We would like to build cross-cultural relationships around the board. So whatever you have, if you feel uh, tingling, like I want to do something, reach out to us. Uh, we do need to, a water system, a water system. We're looking to create a permanent water system in addition to collecting rainwater to preserve what's going on. So we need a water system. We're working on getting a fence, and we need you all as support to create a relationship to sustain and help relieve the things going on, help com combat health disparities, combat depression, and all that. Gardens are really helpful for all of that. And when we come together as after the COVID, after everybody was shut in, it helps us as a whole. So again, I'm Jasmine. Um, please reach out to me. We really need your support. If you would like to send a financial donation, you can send it to Ashley Tabernacle Church of God in Christ and put it in the memo as a perfect gift community garden initiative. In addition, USDA, um, Dr. Kafani said that we would like to have a meeting with those in the community that are supporting and would like to support this project so we can get on one accord and talk about what is the real importance in Colombia and what's the real need and why we need it here. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jazz. And Mark, I know, I know we have been talking <coughs> excuse me, about the words first. And, and I know you're looking at the words. <coughs> but as Jasmine was talking, I was wondering if it would be possible somehow, we should have this discussion with coming words from you, to be able to run a line onto that lot. It's, it's possible, it's private land, so you have to go through the act and, and get permission to do that. But I, I believe it, it's physically feasible to do that. And, and maybe we should meet with Dave Lewis and see, uh, see what the possibilities are. And also, we would have to have the approval of uh, Mr. Mulberry. Perfect. But we're looking, we're looking for some tanks and uh, hoping we come up with something soon. Mm -hmm. And just in support of that owner, um, Mulberry said that we would be in support of everything. If we would like written documentation, we can provide that upon request. We may be able to get them to donate. And would, would the uh, fire department be a source of refreshing that water for us over the summer months if we don't go to a permanent line in the ground? If we got tanks with the fire department, I, I couldn't speak to the fire department, but I'd be glad to reach out to them and ask them if they'd be willing to do that for us. I can't, can't imagine. <laughs> Is that what a. Uh, no, um, no corn doesn't have any chlorine yes. in the water? Yeah, it does. It's public okay. water as well, yeah. Cool thing. So I'm going to step away from the chlorine water. <laughs> but I will trust the well, rainwater to let you with the rain and, um, There's a possibility that they could draw from the river sure. into their tanker and fill it that way. Yeah, that would be doable. Yeah. Uh, she says step away and you know she understands it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Uh, next we have Mr. Lutz. Yeah, uh, first thing tonight is is I would like to read a proclamation. Uh, proclaiming the EMS week, uh, and the proclamation reads, whereas emergency medical service is a vital public service, and whereas the members of emergency medical services teams are ready to provide life-saving care to those in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week, <clears throat> and whereas access to quality emergency care dramatically improves the survival and recovery rate of those who experience sudden illness or injury, and whereas emergency medical services has grown to fill a gap by providing important out-of-hospital care, including preventative medicine, follow-up care, and access to telemedicine, and whereas the emergency medical services system consists of first responders, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, emergency medical dispatchers, 
firefighters, police officers, educators, administrators, pre-hospital nurses, emergency nurses, emergency physicians, trained members of the public, and others out of the hospital medical care providers. And whereas the members of emergency medical service teams, whether career or volunteer, engage in thousands of hours of specialized training and continuing education to enhance their life-saving skills, and whereas it is appropriate to recognize the value and the accomplishments of medical emergency medical service providers by designating Emergency Medical Services Week. So now, therefore, I leo Lutz Mayor of Burke, Columbia, Pennsylvania, in recognition of this event, to hereby proclaim the week of May 21st through 27, 2023, as Emergency Medical Services Week. And I encourage all of this community to take a moment to honor those members of the EMS system who serve this community with honor and integrity. Could, could you all stand? Everybody, uh, Mayor Lutz, the Columbia Borough Council, the residents of Columbia. Uh, this morning we'll be here for uh, coffee and donuts. Uh, they honored EMS. If it wasn't for these men and women, uh, day in and day out, they see the worst of the worst. And they're back on the street um, saving lives. So uh, we couldn't do it without these men and women. Uh, I am the manager, but these are the folks that are out there saving lives and I owe it to them and I appreciate their job the job they do. So thank you very much. I just want to thank manager uh, Martin and the EMTs and paramedics that came out to coffee and donuts with PMT this morning. I got to spend a good half hour or more with uh, paramedic Zachary Rose. Judy Cole, thanks guys. Rose, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys. Rose and Burrow uh, hanging out and then we're learning more about what happens on uh, one of these calls and concerns that you guys um, you know, put up with. So, grateful for what you do. Um, truthfully, honestly, I don't think I've met a finder or worked with a better uh, EMS agency since my tenure here on council. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Okay. You're losing everybody. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. We gotta get a quick picture. Yeah. Just come here. Yeah, you got to Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Plus. Is that a good one? Uh, recent department has been 
I'll say busy <laughs> your last month or so. Uh, they have done, an extra, in my mind, an extraordinary job in solving some of the open cases that we had and uh, also teaming with the Sheriff's Department, county detectives, uh, the, I guess the CERT team and, and, and the Drug Task Force US and Marshals Task Force. US Marshals Task Force and have made some very significant uh, arrests. And also they have teamed with our Code Enforcement Department uh, on some issues and that worked out very well and I'm really encouraged to see that our code enforcement personnel and our police personnel are getting together and I'll say doing a one-two punch on some of these bad places we have in town. So thank you all. Chief, I don't know if you want to fill in. I don't really have anything else to add. Um, I know our officers are working hard for the community to uh, try and clean up some issues that we uh, have been impacting uh, certain neighborhoods. Thank you, Mayor, for the recognition. Um, do you have anything else? No. Okay. I just wanted to uh, once again bring to everyone's attention. We uh, had the honor of having a congressman, a U.S. congressman, um, Lloyd Smucker, thank you, uh, visit us on Friday to uh, bring recognition to uh, Chief Harry Hartman, who passed away in the line of duty. Um, 100 years ago, actually, actually on April 4th, 1923. So Chief Harvey was killed in line of duty on the 200 block of Union Street. Uh, we detailed uh, some of the information uh, regarding this incident on our Crime Watch page. So I would welcome you to, uh, to view that. But it was truly an honor to have uh, you know Congressman Smucker here. And he also read into the uh, congressional record uh, some information on the incident and honor the uh, life and service of Chief Hartman. So, that was special. And here I have the documents, uh, the official document. So, we were very proud of this. And Chief Hartman's uh, great, 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 great grandson right. was here also. So, that was kind of, that was kind of special as well. He and his wife, Scott he, Hartman. Yep, he Scott Hartman. Wife, yes. The last living relatives of Chief Hartman, right? For our knowledge, yes. Thank you. All right. All right. Next, um, at this point at 727, I am adjourning the regular borough council meeting. And at 727, I am entering the public hearing for the 2023 CDDG application for the curb and paving project located along 200 block of Union Street. Derek, you're up. This is just, I mean, this is an incredible lead-in with Chief Brommer just reading that the, the death of Chief Hartman occurred on the 200 block of Union Street, which is the exact block <laughs> we're going to talk about applying for CDDG grant for. Um, so I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, before we get started, are there any members of the audience who are here for this hearing who live on Union Street by any chance? Okay. I'd always like to know that. Okay, so this has become a, a very annual thing here for the Borough of Columbia. Uh, the Community Development Block, Block Grant Program, or CDBG program, is administered through the Lancaster County Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Uh, they solicit applications annually uh, for a variety of qualifying projects. In this case, uh, we have traditionally and, and continue to pursue public improvements projects um, basically one block at a time. Um, so our, um, our latest projects here that we've done in the borough, this project is a continuation of that. So we kind of jumped down, we did, the, uh, we did Second Street, Okay, we did a, a section basically the 100 block of 2nd Street. Then we jumped over, we did Mill Street. This year, we're doing the 200 block of 2nd Street, which is due to begin here in about a month. That's going to bring us all the way from basically 4th Street to Union in a straight, complete reconstruction. So what we're targeting this year is we want to continue this trend 
and, and turn the corner here and start heading up Union to 3rd Street. So the scope of this project, one more mark, the program, the scope of the project we're proposing is picking up right at 2nd uh, and Union. Our current project is going to take care of the intersection of 2nd and Union. You'll get all the ADA ramps there and, and new paving. And we will start, uh, at least proposing to start there at St. Peter's Church and go all the way up Union Street to the 3rd Street intersection, including the 3rd Street intersection, replacing all four of the ADA ramps and repaving that intersection back past each ramp to give us a good, nice tie in seam on every one of them. I know that's a very heavily traveled intersection, not only by vehicles, but also pedestrians. Uh, again, in addition to trying to just continue the projects um, that we've been working on, which is a logical step. One of the things we evaluate these projects for is the need, okay? So to qualify, you need to be in a census tract that consists of, the, I don't ask me how they came up with this exact number, but it's 46.74% low to moderate income, okay? So collectively in the census tract, the collective income needs to be of a percentage greater than 46.74%. This is block group one of the borough, which runs basically along the river. Um, it runs almost completely along the river, from the river up to Third Street is where this census tract is. And the low to moderate percentage income is actually a little over 68%. Uh, so a very high percentage of residents living in this area of town would qualify as low to moderate income. So it's really what we're trying to focus on with this program. Uh, a big thing that we always look at is ADA improvements. Okay, so you've heard me a lot talk about the ramps. We're always upgrading our curb ramps. One of the biggest things for, for um, ADA is the cross slope of the sidewalk. Um, a lot of our sidewalks in town are kind of this way. Uh, the sidewalk could be heaved, it could be cracked, it could be shifted. So what we're trying to do when we redo these projects is create a safe, ADA compliant pedestrian pathway. And that's really the base of the, the grant. So the grant will pay for that, that end of what we're trying to do. And then as a bonus, we always look for streets that need to be paved. So when we do the curb and sidewalk and the ADA ramps, beautify the street, then the last thing we're gonna do is pave it have a nice fresh street when we're done. Uh, we also evaluated this street for its uh, existing utilities. If you've been following any of the projects we've done from the past, I know they seem like they go on forever, but it's because we try to get all of the utilities in before us. So our, our project might only last three months, but it seems like we have the street torn apart for a year or two. It's because the water company gets in there and then the gas company gets in there and then potentially the sewer. Uh, so we try to get everybody in there so that we can do this once and be done. We don't have to go back and tear the street up again. We continue that, um, that strategy here. We have the utilities all done. Uh, and again, what we looked at for eligibility and Mark has some photos up there. The sidewalk is, is nearing the end of its life. Um, one place where we actually do have good sidewalk is along the St. Peter's Church parcel along Union. Uh, this project would not propose to replace that sidewalk because it's in very good condition, very serviceable. There is no need to, to waste money on, on tearing that up and fixing it. So that actually helps our budget numbers on this, takes a nice chunk out. Uh, so that's basically, that's basically the gist of the scope is the curb lines will remain the same. Uh, there is a spot there um, where Union Street hits 3rd Street on the north side. For some reason, the curbing up there is like 12, 13 inches tall. You know, look at dropping that down a little bit so that the residents aren't scraping their doors every time they get out there. So that might be the one, that's the one change you might see. Otherwise, the general geometry of the street is, is going to remain the same. Just a nice refresh with new curb and sidewalk everywhere. Again, that picture over there on the right is a great, uh, that's a great, great example of what we have for most of the block. The, the sidewalk's crumbling. So, but that's our approach. The ask will be for $200,000, which is the maximum ask we can have for a CDBG grant. And there is a small match requirement, I believe it's 15% of 
Um, my estimate is that this project's going to come in at around three hundred thousand dollars all in. So uh, that counts um, engineering and then just some additional match dollars for the construction. So if there are any questions on the project, I'm happy to answer those. Hey, Nate. <laughs> um, so I, Nate Roach, I live over on 200 block of Perry Street, so just a block over. I'm wondering, is there any room possibility uh, to include a study um, for the possibility of putting a stop sign uh, crossing over 2nd Street from the from Union going throughout the hill? Uh, I only ask because uh, so I, it's actually the route that I take to take my daughter to school every morning, and um, it's really difficult to look left on the Union Street and to see if there's traffic coming. It makes me nervous almost every time I cross over. So just wondering if that's even something that can be considered. For this. Where would the where would the stop? Where, where are you looking for a stop sign? On the intersection of Union and Second. That's Union and Second. So Second has a stop sign to cross over mm -hmm. Union. But he does not have a stop sign to cross over second. Okay. That's something I can definitely talk to, to Jake about. Um, I don't think anything we're doing with the project, again, we're, we're going to hit that intersection with the project that's going to start here in a month or two. But nothing we're doing in that project would preclude us from putting a stop sign in down the line if it's so warranted. So I don't mind having a discussion with Jake. Yeah. Be, be involved with that one too. Yep. Yeah. So, sure. Thanks, Thanks Jake. Derek, you, you estimated the cost of 300000 set to the borough, or does that include CBD, CDBG, and the borough? No, that would, that would be the borough. So the borough cost would be about 100 CDBG okay. funds would be 200 assuming we, we get full funding. Okay, thank you. Derek, uh, you answered my one question about the curbing deal up near 3rd Street. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question I have is there isn't a tree on that block. No. Any possibility of getting a tree or two? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we'll look at um, we'll look at opportunities to add them. There's absolutely opportunity on the on the St. Peter's side. Um, I think I think this is something we have been working a little bit better with the Shade Tree Commission lately and the Sheriff's been a little bit more involved. So I'd like to have a discussion with them and, and basically get their get their recommendations for where they would like to see the trees and then I can look at it from my end and make sure it's feasible. We need to make sure we're away from the buildings enough. And one of the toughest things, is especially when you have these these homes all kind of stacked together, is all the utilities coming through. You gotta find a spot that's big enough to fit a tree well in there without putting it in over water or a gas line and it becomes challenging. The, the north side seems to be better. Yeah. It's and very on the south side, there's the area where a couple of homes sit back. Mm -hmm. Yep. There will be an opportunity. Yep, I agree. Now, do we have to go to the resident and say, can we put a tree in? Because ultimately, they're responsible to maintain that. Yeah, we, we don't, as far as I know, have a policy on that. We've tried in the, the last time we tried to do this, we tried to do it diplomatically on the seven and eight hundred block of Walnut Street and kind of made it an option where we gave the resident, would you like a tree? Wouldn't you like a tree? Uh, personally, I don't think that went very well. Um, we have obviously the residents were who wanted the trees were very happy with it, but we actually had some people who were right next to each other fighting over who was going to get the trees. So we have situations up there where we have some trees that are too close to one another. And then we have large gaps of no tree. Um, I mean, even to the point that we were out there putting a tree well in, people would come out, oh, don't you put a tree there? So it, it's something we absolutely need to talk about. Yeah, I, I think we should do that before we spec out the project then. Because yeah. This hasn't even been surveyed yet, yeah. so you're you're in the very beginning stage. You know, really, it's not even a project yet, so you right. need to approve you to apply for the grant and stuff. Okay. Yep. I appreciate the forty six percent number. What's that thought? I appreciate the forty six percent statistic sure. requirement. Sure. Um, I know there was a lot of conversation around this table about sidewalk ordinance and who gets the advantage of public dollars when it comes to sidewalk. Uh, that number was significant, and I think that I feel good about that. It justifies and uh, uh, you know 
these kind of projects, this kind of use of this kind of money. So I'm glad that you included that one. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments, or concerns from council? I know Frank. No? All right. From the public, Frank. Yeah, Frank Belford. You had said uh, we get 200 on the grant, mm -hmm. and if, if we get it, if we don't get it, who puts up the balance? Well, that, that's going to be for council to decide if the grant, if we do not receive the grant, my assumption is this project does not move forward, especially at least in its current state. So the current proposal is a full streetscape of replacement of curb and sidewalk, ADA ramps, and street paving. If if we don't get the two hundred thousand dollar grant, um, we'll have to come back to council and say, do you want to proceed with this project and pay completely with borough funds or fund it some other way? But this so this this action tonight is only authorizing me and Mark to apply for the grant. And if we get the grant, we'll be back to say, hey, we got the grant. Are we good to move forward with the commitment of $100,000 to finish the project? Has it been in the past that they'll pay some of it? The borough is required to pay, you mean the CBG? You don't get the full grant. You want to, you're going after two, say you pay 100 we've been, we've been fortunate in the past. I think the only time, for our, for our public improvements projects, we have gotten sums of less than 200 in the past. But a lot of it has been due to sometimes the estimates were lower than that. I remember the first the first block of Second Street we did in between uh, Perry and Mill. I think that project was only 200 total out the door. So we only asked for 170 grand that year, for instance. I think the the only time I can I can remember that we asked for more money and didn't get all of it was when we got a CDBG grant for the Market House. That they asked for 200, only got 100. But in the same year, we also got a $200,000 grant to fund another street project. So that was the one year I remember we got 300. The only year that I'm aware of that we applied for more than one CDBG grant and actually got okay. both. Okay. Yeah. But that isn't, it, it, to answer your question directly, it's not on the table that they might not come back to us and say, we'll offer you 100 even though you asked for 200. Mm -hmm. We'll need to have a, a discussion then. Are there any other questions, comments, or concerns from the public? All right. At this time, 7.42 p.m., I am closing the public hearing. And at 7.42 p.m., I am reopening the regular borough council meeting. And for our first action item, do I have a motion to adopt resolution 2023-19? Authorizing C.S. Davidson to submit a CDBG grant for curb sidewalk mill and overlay project on the 200 block of Union Street. Okay. Okay. A motion by Councilperson Stoll, second by Councilperson Kaufman to adopt resolution 2023-19, authorizing C.S. Davidson to submit a CDBG grant. Are there any questions, concerns, comments on the motion? Done. I have a motion by Council Person Stall, second by Council Person Kaufman to adopt resolution 2023 19 to authorize C.S. Davidson to submit a CDBG grant for a curved sidewalk mill and overlay project on the 200 block of Union Street. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. Uh, next twelve B and C. I think what I would like to do is have invite a realtor to come forward to present the offers on these. Um, yeah. Okay. And I think on this one, I would recommend council go ahead and discuss these offers, and then when you're ready, following discussion, bring forward a motion as you see fit. Good evening, council members, council president. Uh, officers and, and members of the, the borough. Before I get into the numbers, details of the two offers that we have to consider this evening, I think both potential buyers are in the audience. 
Yeah, I think it would be a good idea since I'm not a part of their project team for them to give me the opportunity to describe in a brief detail what their plans are to further assist you in making a proper decision this evening. Would that be okay? Yes, I was hoping that we would hear that as well. Okay. You know, by the way, you need to introduce myself. Right? No, no <laughs> just state your name for the record. Jeff Seibert, okay. Associate Broker with Keller Williams, Elite okay. Realty. Thank you. Um, um, so we're going to do, do a brief presentation by each uh, bidder and then Jeff will give us the numbers. Sounds great. Sounds good. I think that's a good idea. All right. Um, going by the agenda, the first one is Cimarron Investments. I'm just going to step back and uh, give the floor to Tom All right. Thank you. Good evening, Council, members of the borough, Mayor. Thanks for the opportunity and thank you for allowing me an extra two weeks to, uh, to be able to come in and present to you. I was unfortunately out of town that day and was unable to attend that meeting. So I don't know if you have our presentation that was emailed, so I'm going to hand that out right now. page you'll see one of our many projects that we've done in the downtown uh, directly across the street from the borough it was a uh, former laundromat that we converted into uh, commercial space on the first floor that contains a state farm office and then we put uh, two residential market rate apartments on the upper levels uh, so that would that give you an idea of the look and feel of what you would see on the corner back up there again and what we're proposing is possibly one to two commercial storefront spaces on the first floor and then four to six market rate apartments on floors two and three and if you notice on the third page um, I have some su supporting information that I provided there basically uh, to outline some of the projects that we've done in the downtown and the success we've had with them uh, as far as the mix of commercial and residential uh, projects. So within the last eight months, 12 vacant storefronts have become occupied. It's a, it's a major accomplishment to be able to say that there's only about two remaining storefronts on Locust Street. It, goes to show that businesses are locating here and uh, taking a chance on Columbia and seeing what else is going on and wanting to be part of that. Um, having market rate apartments provide new residents that have discretionary income to support downtown businesses, market house and other services offered. Uh, I spoke with uh, Market House Manager Chris Fira and he indicated to me that he's seen a number of residents that are occupying both of the new apartment projects on Locust Street uh, in the Market House shopping you know, on a weekly basis. So that idea of creating um, an economic boom or economic uh, situation in the downtown with the idea of bringing people in that, that have additional income to support the businesses that are locate, being uh, located here and, and coming here. So it's, it's kind of a, a good balance and uh, a great thing to see happen. Um, 
I believe that the uh, commercial residential mix we're proposing helps to create an economically stable town. Many of the investments that you have made in the Northwest River Trail, the Market House, Columbia Crossings, just to name a few, have created a, an attractive, vibrant place that is attractive to new residents and businesses wishing to locate here. So there's there's investments that the borough has made with other organizations, uh, counties, state funds. Um, we're, we're seeing the benefits of that because along with shopping and restaurants and cafes and, and different offerings that we have now in the downtown that, that pair with all of that, it's creating a destination here in Columbia that uh, hasn't been seen in a long, long time. Um, and finally, within the last year, 72 new market rate apartments have been constructed at 131 Locust Street and 315 Locust Street. These two properties are close to being occupied with strong demand for additional units. So we are about 92% occupied across the street already, and we still have applicants coming forward uh, in the healthcare industry and uh, manufacturing that are locating here because it's centralized between York and Lancaster. Uh, it's, it's a great location. There's amenities here to offer outside of their apartment within walking distance. So we're, we want to continue that that pace and that growth in that direction to continue growing the downtown back to a, a vibrant community. Um, listed below there, you'll see some pictures of, of some projects that uh, we have done. Uh, the Northwest Bank, former Northwest Bank, was converted to a bridal shop uh, a vacant um, tobacco warehouse was converted into a brewery. Um, 301 was renovated, all six apartments, elevator installed, and a cafe on the first floor. Ankles, as many of you know, has been completely restored. Um, and then obviously the, the project directly across the street that you see every time you go out the front doors here. That's, uh, that's a great project. It, it went very well, went very fast, and uh, we had a great uh, opportunity there to create this type of uh, occupancy in that building and uh, help continue to support the downtown with additional revenue streams for local businesses. Is there any questions? I have a question for you. Um, you had said four to six apartments, is that correct? That's correct. Is there um, any reason why you wouldn't consider like home ownership like condominium style? That is not our our type of business. That's not the lane that we are in specifically. We are in providing a rental property that uh, isn't condominiumized. It's well, uh, the reason I ask that is because I think you said on the ad hoc committee and they had said this week that their goal on May 18th, their goal was to encourage and increase home ownership. So I just was curious why it would not. Um, yeah, sure. And, and that's that's encompassing the whole borough. So when when we were on that committee and discussing home ownership, uh, there's a lot more places in the borough where home ownership is taking place uh, with the project that Habitat's doing on, on 5th Street is, is a great project that we're uh, happy to see uh, and that's going to create home ownership. Uh, condominiums in the downtown is typically a, a, a lease rent situation so that that encompasses all of that housing that was part of the ad hoc committee so I believe we took into account you know not just home ownership, but also rentals and uh, other situations. And one last thing, um, had, with four to six apartments, have you considered parking? How that would work? Oh, you can get to be so much more Yeah, you know, I have, and that would be part of the plan that we would bring before the zoning and planning commissions uh, at the appropriate time. Uh, there may be other components to the design that would. Uh, 
in that. So yeah, of course we've considered it. Thank you. That's all. So with four to six apartments, would you then be looking for zoning variances? Are there variances you would be looking for? We didn't, or, go, in, we didn't go into that detail with the, with the plan uh, based on making an offer. Uh, as far as engineering and things like that, that's where that would all be, be brought out and, and uh, worked out. The irony is because that's a, you know, that's a gamble there. You have to go in front of someone to get <coughs> approval to get your project going. That's, you know, that's what we're Sure, sure. And there, there was a building there before. Um, there was, there's going to be some foundation work because I believe it was just filled in. So we have to take all of that excavation and, and site work into account as well. So it's, uh, it's not a, a shovel ready project that you can just start building on. Right. Question what your time frame would be on uh, um, for construction? I would say within the next 12 months, depending on construction prices, inflation, and things like that, and, and design, uh, working on the plans and getting the various approvals. It, it could take a little bit longer than that, but. Um, as president of the Merchants Association, I mean, that lot during that time, we would continue making it available for Fourth Friday events and any other type of events that would be going on. Um, we would make that lot available for those sorts of community activities. Uh, I would just like to make a comment. Um, I also my about the housing and as he was speaking I was thinking I couldn't help but think of the other neighborhoods in Columbia and the revitalization of our downtown area has been something that has been planned in the works for probably five to ten years and we've done an excellent job of doing that and I think there needs to be a time where we focus on the other neighborhoods but this is their lane you know what I mean? That's the, the lane for revitalizing the economy has focused on Locust Street. And we do need to focus on the other neighborhoods. And we need to find someone to take that thing too. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Next. Uh, um, oh. In case Jeff, Jeff doesn't mention, we are able to settle on next Thursday. So. Thank you. And Habitat, did you guys want to just refresh? Absolutely. So this is Habitat for Men. John, nice to finally put a nice name Good evening. Thank you for uh, having us take the opportunity to speak to We're proposing to build by the way, this, this lot, everything you said about it is absolutely true. It's it's prime location. It's right here in the heart. It's very visible. It's walking distance to amazing amenities in a great community people want to live in. I have home buyers that would love to live in home care. Owner occupied homes. We serve forty to eighty percent very median income. I only do home ownership and I am in order to make the two units of home ownership possible. And because it's on Locust Street, we are going to adapt, improvise, collaborate. I'm actually don't have drawings for the very reason that I want to secure the property and then collaborate on what those designs actually look like for that property on the storefront and getting at least about 1,200, you know, basically the equivalent of a uh, World War II style home you know, post-World War II, very adaptable homes, a couple of bedrooms, some storage, and able to move a, uh, a small family. Uh, if I may, let me read you something that we uh, just prepared to be sending out to some of our partners, some other families that uh, we're serving. <laughs> and his optimism has carried her through a life filled with challenges. It's what has driven her to advance her nursing career while working full-time as a single mother. It's what spurred her to move her children out of her unsafe neighborhood and into her mom's dining room as temporary shelter. 
and it's what inspired her to check Habitat's website each and every morning for two years, hoping that home applications would open and offer her a chance to turn a dream into reality. On a cold day midwinter, Kenya's wish came true. Over a five-day period in January, our Habitat team reopened applications for homes and received 115 submissions in response. An incredible number that demonstrates the desperate lack of affordable homes available in our communities. Since that time, we have welcomed the first of our new, newest home, home buyers to our program, Kenya, Emily, Natasha, and Evelise. And uh, we're still continuing to work through another group of 60, by the way. These future home buyers share an unwavering determination and enthusiasm for the journey of home ownership that's ahead of them. By example, Emily has completed the 100 hours of sweat equity she needs to officially be matched to her half that home. She did it in one month. An unofficial record, actually. <laughs> Single heads of household have to get up to 250 sweat equity hours for the house completion to be able to move in and have their affordable zero interest mortgage. If you have a double head of household, you need 400 sweat equity hours. There's another thing that these dynamic, uh, that the, that these dynamics share. Past frustrations in keeping to find a warm, safe home in today's housing market. Both Kenya and Emily were approved for a conventional mortgage, but the amount was so low, it was impossible to find a home they could afford. I was approved for a $79,000 mortgage, said Emily. The house I saw had no back or front door, and yet at least $100,000 in renovations. My realtor felt so bad it was all she had to show me. At the time of writing this letter, there are only, which was just actually a week, week ago, there were only 258 existing homes on the market in Winchester County. According to the National Association of Realtors, inventory this time of year is typically twice that amount. And families of modest means find it terribly difficult to purchase a home in today's market. Then lower income, first time home buyers find it almost impossible. We're here to transform lives. That's why I'm here asking for an opportunity to be able to develop this lot freely and collaboratively. That's where Habitat comes in. And to reiterate, the model, Habitat's unique role in serving as both the builder and the lender is critical during challenging housing markets such as today's. We work within the space where scarce inventory and conventional mortgages are failing hardworking lower income families. Families with steady income who are ready for the responsibility of home ownership. And if there's a fault, we'll take care of it. We'll make sure that home stays affordable for the next family. We've actually got a, uh, we served about 300 families in the last 36 years. And we foreclosed, my best of my knowledge, one, we started a handful and we haven't had Complete, which is a wonderful thing. We have a lot of success. We can do loss mitigation like nobody else. <coughs> great, great members of the community here. Thanks to partners like you, we have acquired the properties needed to create a strong pipeline of future home projects, which enable us to reopen applications earlier this year. As we continue to review the applications, our, our team will welcome even more families into our program and offer them an opportunity to build their birth their future. I want to give them another opportunity to live here. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I think we asked them before. I don't know. All right, go ahead. Um, do you have any idea what kind of square footage each of these? Because you said it would be two, is that correct? Yes. Do you have any idea what's Yeah, to, typically our homes we, we aim for about twelve hundred square feet. Okay, we we actually go we've actually gone up to well over two thousand in some cases, but okay, it depends on what's available. Okay. You know, possible. We like that storage, which is a key component, uh, especially this day and age. A lot of the uh, actually the uh, some of the uh, older homes that we really have haven't had that and we've been able to be creative and create great few customers, creative architects <laughs> and that will help us out with those things. And you said you did review the zoning 
We have. So that you would be in compliance. We're, with we're, 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 we're aware of the challenges. I mean, a lot of things you just spoke about in terms of the foundation, we realized probably like a full foundation case would not be possible. There's some complications there. We're going to evaluate those, work with what is necessary to make it possible. Uh, may or may not have to have stormwater because of some of the things that are going to need there. Uh, we also understand that there's a window along the adjacent building. We can go up to it, but we'll have to make sure if we're here to have giving some space for that light to go in there. So, respectful neighborhood, contextual. Obviously, if we want as much input about it as possible. Would you be looking at a two or a three story? Three story. Which matches the street zone? So. Yeah, exactly. Any other questions for Habitat? Nope. All right. Nope. Um, audience. Who's going to do this numbers first? All right. All right. All right. Do you have a question for Habitat? Yeah. No. Yeah. All right. Well, My question to council is, do you understand the ordinance? What does the ordinance say when you're selling a property? What ordinance? The ordinance, the ordinance for selling a property. What, what are the rules that you have to abide by? Do you, do you mean the borough code, Frank? Yes. That's so, right, so what we have to do if we're selling real property that's an ex valued in excess of $6,000, right? It either has to, be advertised or it has to go to a public auction, which also has to be advertised, right? For you either do sealed bids or public auction. After you've advertised it twice and haven't gotten any bids, then you can sell it essentially any way that you choose, right? Which is why we've gotten to this point. We advertised twice, we didn't receive any sealed bids during that time period. And so now we've moved towards selling it this way. And that's that's really what we're governed by. So I don't know if that answers your question. And that's in the rule. That is yeah. in the borough code, and then there's another act that actually governs what happens after the uh, after the the second advertisement no bids. Yeah. Well, my information that I got was it's done with a sealed bid, and then you take the highest bid. That's not. That oh, and that that is normally the case. But after you've advertised it twice and not gotten any bids, that's no longer the case. If we're going by law, yeah. that's that's the yeah. way it's done. Yeah. Oh. Sure. I have one question for Alex. Would this be involved in anything in reduced taxing to builders? Uh, no, it, well, we're a nonprofit and we don't have to pay sales tax on a lot of things. So we pay property taxes, we pay transfer taxes. We, we probably could. I, I've never experimented with that, if that answers your question. I refer to home ownership. The, the, the owners would pay their property taxes. That would be revenue, okay. is property taxes. Okay. Yeah. And, and we ask her for that as well. Thank you. Jeff. Any questions for me before I start? Nope. Okay. Not me. <laughs> what I'd like to do is to refer to these as offer one and offer two. Okay. Uh, and I will review the basic terms that they're on the same standard border break agreement of sale. So all the fine details for each offer are very, very, very similar. Offer one is a purchase price of $60,000. Uh, the buyer is not asking for the borough to pay any of their closing costs as part of that purchase price. So the net to the borough before your normal cost would be $60,000. There's no escalation clause as part of that agreement of sale. The deposit money is $5,000. Uh, the buyer of offer one would like an acceptance by tomorrow, which hopefully the borough can do, and they would settle June 1st, 2023. It's not contingent upon uh, the sale of another property. It is a cash offer. There's no financing involved. It's 
It's not contingent upon an appraisal. There are no inspections or due diligence period. So it's basically an as-is cash offer at $60,000 with a closing date of June 1st. Offer two is $58,000. The buyer's not asking for any seller assist. And so the net to the grow is $58,000. There is an escalation clause on top of that offer. For those of you who do not understand an escalation clause, an escalation clause allows this buyer to raise their offer by a specific amount of money in the event there is another offer with a higher net return to the seller than theirs. In this case, there is. So the escalation clause would become applicable. The escalation clause, as part of this offer, says that they will raise their offer by $500 over the competing offer up to a maximum sales price of $75,000. Now that $75,000 is not their offer. Their offer based on the escalation clause would now become $60,500. Does everybody make, does that make sense to everybody? Yes. The deposit money with this offer is $10,000. This buyer, offer two, would like an acceptance of tomorrow, and I hope that the borough can do that. They would settle or before June 24th, so in essence, the 30-day close. It's not contingent upon the sale or settlement of another property. There's no financing involved. It, too, is a cash offer. There's no appraisal contingency in this offer. There's no inspections or due diligence period in this offer. So it, too, is an all-cash as-is offer. The net difference between the two offers will be slightly less than $500 because the commission is a percentage base. So it's going to cost you another 5% of that $500. So, so it's a roughly $500 difference, but not quite. Thank you. Any questions? Questions, comments, concerns? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Two very, very good offers. My take on it is this is fourth and locust. This is in the heart or downtown. Putting two homes there to me don't do what we want in our downtown business district. Uh, to Councilperson Fisher's comment. Uh, we have we have a and as much as I like habitat, don't get me wrong. I think they're a great organization. I hope that they continue to do more work in Columbia. We have a habitat project on South Fifth Street in the two hundred block. We have an opportunity for housing in the one hundred block where there was two homes damaged by fire. Uh, so if you look at that, if you look at all the projects completed and in the works through the through the uh, land bank that we have completed and ongoing. I think we're reaching out into the neighborhoods and making that what you suggested, Councilperson Fisher. And and I like I like doing things in the neighborhoods where we that's where we need help. We don't need help in the downtown per se for residences. What we need is retail in the downtown. And if it so be so be it that there happens to be some some market rate apartments uh, attached to that, fine, but the retail is the key. And I think that's that's what you all have to look at. Retail space in your downtown. Uh, and then look at out in the in the neighborhoods. Go out in the neighborhoods and, and we have been doing that and continue to do that and step it up and forge the relationship stronger with habitat than we already have. I think those three houses that's going in uh, there were three houses down on four houses, three houses down on Perry Street, um, one over on South on North Second Street. So we we already uh, have have partnered with Habitat for eight homes, uh, and hopefully we were looking to do more. 
So I think that's the thing to do. You work with Habitat and the land bank, get out in the neighborhoods and change those neighborhoods. I think the merchants are doing a pretty good job uh, changing the downtown and let's continue that change in the downtown, or I should say that infill into into retail and possibly some apartment units as well. Your decision though. But Leo, the, the Habitat project is proposing retail on the first floor. I just heard two homes. No, it's it's commercial, commercial first floor. It is commercial first floor because that's, Three what, stories. that's what our zoning ordinance is. And the difference between... No, you can do a house on the, in, in the commercial district. I mean, house. But, and that's what I heard you a house. No, uh, no, no. 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 There's a first floor retail, second and third floor residential. There's no difference between a, a owner occupied residential and an apartment residential. Heather, can we just hear from Habitat just to make sure yeah. everybody's clear on what I, I didn't hear that. Well, I don't and, and if you all remember, if you all remember, I was, he was, he was, he was, I was working for you. I know you. I let us stand you got me a thought right now, professional member. So our, our plan is for a three story structure to be able to have adequate parking. Uh, and we actually we thought about it, our tough reaction we first saw it a lot was we can get three story homes, you know, flats going in there. And uh, uh, wisely as we looked around, we're like, Oh that, that's a main street locust street is something that is downtown. And you don't want to actually live on the main floor. <laughs> our, our architect pointed that out. As soon as we heard that, we were like, you know, if we can get two units in there, we will. But we recognize that we would have to have a, uh, a commercial space that we could at least partner with, uh, and design, shape, and so forth along with, with the uh, community here. And then have two uh, pumps that would be having all stored. Okay, so, so, so I'm clear now. And thank you. Of course. Uh, of course, had another example. Uh, retail on the first floor. Yes. One retail space. Yes. For one, mean, that's one, one, one retail space, <coughs> one, one residential space on the second, and one on the third. Because you indicated two, two units. That's what we're thinking right now. Okay. How many retail spaces are you looking at? Yeah. Yeah. Two. Two retail spaces, four units. Correct. Four to six. 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 Four it's possible we can even uh, uh, work with uh, uh, another real estate agent, you know, somebody in the community and so forth, and be able to reach out as well. There are there are other habitat affiliates across the nation that have utilized a similar method mm -hmm. uh, with rental space like that. Okay. Uh, well, I wanted to get all counsel first. Well, no, I don't have any questions for anybody, but I would I would like to say that you know. Um, it's good to have two offers, two good offers, two good offers from organizations that are already very active in the borough. Um, you know, and both of you, Simone Investments and Habitat and Manhattan have outstanding track records of success. Um, that's not what we had the first time around. We had two offers from folks we barely knew. It was some sketchy napkin drawings and a weak number. And we jumped on that like by one race in the middle of you know, the middle of a, of a session to see where they went with it. It's really good to have qualified, good people with good offers that are investing in the borough here. So that goes without saying. In fact, that's good to say. Thank you. Um, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Director, for having to talk to you. Andrew. Andrew? Andrew from Habitat. These are on the phone. It's like Andrew Slay. Okay, so Andrew, right? <laughs> and you gave your first presentation. Uh, you can see the passion in your presentation, right? Uh, you're a guy with a purpose. I get that. I mean, that, that comes to you. have purpose. And I think where there's purpose, there's possibility. Um, I've seen the work that Simron does. Uh, I've seen the investment that Simron has done. Um, I see the 
the effect of what Simran has done over the last 10 years in the borough. And it's been incredible. That being said, um, this word was used several times in blame. Honestly, I think that this project is out of Habitat for Humanity's lane. I think what Habitat for Humanity does in projects where there's dilapidated, condemned buildings, uh, homes, where you come in and have residents in neighborhoods, form communities in neighborhoods, with other neighbors and other homeowners, that completely makes sense, and I'm all about that. I've seen what Cimarron has done in the down, this is for council, I've seen what Cimarron has done in the downtown with their investments. They bring business to the borough. They're bringing a market rate, a housing to the borough, uh, bringing enthusiasm to the borough. Um, and as was stated earlier, there's a huge amount of investment taking place on multiple projects in the borough to attract folks to the borough. All of that has has coalesced with what's happening now downtown and um, uh, my, this, I don't know whose numbers are who on this, right? If you're just going by the numbers, is it, is it inappropriate to ask whose numbers are who, who, who is all for one and who is all for two? Because I'm more interested in making a decision based on who I believe is the best fit for this project. Since we have two offers on the line here, so. Mm -hmm. I was wondering the same thing, but we might first consider in the action item B and then move to action item C without knowing who gave what bid. Okay. Well, no, because I have to put the amount in the motion. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you will need to. For sunshine, I have to know. Yeah. yeah. Who, what, where? We're talking about $500 difference right. in offer. Mm -hmm. There's no possibility of a counter offer tonight. That's correct. It's not going to happen. We've got five hundred dollar difference in offers. Mm -hmm. I think this is way more than a few few hundred bucks uh, to collect on a piece of property for the good of the budget. Um, I think this is about the budget moving forward. What's best for the downtown? Not that you guys aren't capable. This is not a. This is not a. Admittedly, you guys said we're not in the retail business. We're not in the retail building business, and we're not in the retail management business. So, uh, I think it's, uh, I, I think that uh, for my reasoning, it's who's the best deal, and I would like to know who's all first. I don't have any, I think I think you can absolutely know who that, that is. So the, the first offer that Jeff read off is with the 60,000 um, as is cash offer is from Cimarron Investments. Um, the second offer, the 58 with the escalation clause is from Heather. Heather? Yes. Just a point to uh, respond to what you said about not having these large chains. We operate at a restore um, that uh, these last couple months has had record breaking uh, sales at, at their environment. We have a manager that's part of that store, and that's also part of our discussion about what to do with this property. Who is he's very good at his job, and it's a different reason why we've had uh, the sales that we've had at that store. So I would not say this. Well, I'm going to be creating a and I did not say that. Actually, no. I mean, never said that we didn't do commercial. We, uh, we specialize in home ownership. Yeah. Was, the, was, I, I, was I not hearing that correctly? Yeah, you're right. That's the gist, right. Right. That was, that's well, gist you got from what he said. Am I paraphrasing? Maybe. I don't specialize in managing rental, but we do have done a lot of all the commercial properties. You own a couple. Thank you for the clarification. Sure. Now that, now, now that I understand both projects, sorry for the misunderstanding because I didn't see that. I now I now look at four to six units of housing versus two. It's a crap ton of cars. That's that's the problem that has to that they have to solve. Any 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 buyer, right? I should say any builder is going to have to comply with planning, zoning, and art. Yes. So you well, have, that's why I asked that. You have you have checks in place. To build I would personally say 
kind of popping off of what Todd laid out there. But personally, both organizations are ones I support and believe in and want to see more of. Um, so it's as far as like weighing the two organizations, it's hard to make that decision. But I'm looking at a couple things. One is the the history of Cimarron in, on Locust Street. Um, their work speaks for themselves. And the difference in the offers being negligible. Um, I'm going to look at long-term um, tax revenues to the borough. So the more units we have in there, the more it is designed to fit with what we know as local streets now is the direction I'm going to lead. Um, but again, I want to see more of both of the organizations keep going and keep on the on the track that, that we've been on the last 10 years. See, if either one of them came tonight by themselves, it would be an easy guess. Yep, for sure. And I, I wish we would have had either of them invite on the, the open bid that we had advertised. <laughs> right. <laughs> but Anyone else here at the table? I know, I want to get off the table first. Joanne, or Laura, do you have any to ask? Eric. No. Joanne. No. Sharon. Nope. Nothing. Um, I just want to say I'm. I don't. I mean, I support both organizations. I think it's great. Um, you know, I sat through listening to the to the comp plan. The comp plan said encourage um, different housing opportunities for all people and all incomes and increase home ownership versus rental um, and I love the fact that this would encourage ownership versus rental and I think oh my gosh four to six what where are you going to get home ownership the two units above habitat of the uh, retail space no, they are no we don't see rental. So, I mean, I like that, and I like the fact that it's getting closer to our comp plan of what the comp plan says. I mean, we paid a lot of money for that plan, and if we're not going to follow it, um, to me that, you know, we spent money for nothing. Um, I mean, I get that it's on Lucas Street, but what I heard was, we, we only want people to live there that have excess money to spend in our in our shops. And I, I mean, I get that desire, but you know, to me that just seems. I look at what's I look at what's living on Locust Street now, and I feel pretty strongly that owner occupied units regardless of their income, would be more desirable than a lot of what we have on the street already. So, I mean, that's just kind of my, my opinion. And again, the comp plan, what the comp plan says, we spend a lot of money for it. We should be, you know, implementing it. And if we're not, we've wasted our money. One project will be No, it doesn't, but you have to start somewhere. You have to start somewhere. You go through, go through it all. All right, so Jeff first, because he's our realtor. Well, I, I'd like to speak as, as, as a realtor, and but then I'd also like to speak as a citizen and a taxpayer. Yep. That's one of mine. <laughs> as a realtor, I, I'd like to say that no matter what happens with council's decision tonight, I hope that I get to work with Andrew uh, on future projects in Columbia because he does have a passion for what he does and I do think there are opportunities within the borough that Habitat could uh, benefit the borough dramatically. Uh, as a taxpayer, I'd like to ask both buyers, do you have any idea what the total cost of your project would be? 
And the reason I'm asking this question is because they're going to have an assessed value, and their assessed value is going to be multiplied by the millage, and it's going to bring in tax dollars in the community, regardless of who owns it or who lives there. And I know it's, it's, it, it, it's going to be a ballpark question. I know it's not going to be a hard number, but just an idea if that, so either of you have an idea. I do. Um, 1.5 million. For those of you who couldn't hear, Don is estimating his project to be about a million and a half. So $1.5 million. And about 1.2, 1.3. And Habitat's project will be about 1.2, 1.3. So they're very close. So not as big a difference as what I had anticipated actually. Mm -hmm. so. I will say that with a caveat that the amount of time that we put this together, there hasn't been time to put that kind of estimate together. So this is based on uh, previous uh, I understand that. It, that it old money. Right, right. That, that, was a, that was a pretty off the cuff question for me to ask. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Um, next we have Mike wanted to speak. I'm Mike Flannery. Um, so we've seen presentations from both Habitat for Community and Sahan. And uh, I don't have any problem with making with somebody making money. But first of all, there are plenty of properties available on the open market for people to invest in. And we have a poverty rate of almost 25% here which is one in four, or 2,500 of our 10,000 residents. And um, because the borough has a unique position, we have a chance to do something to actually alleviate some of the poverty that we have. Um, I'm sure someone's proposal would be nice, um, but really that just benefits people who are already doing really well. Um, but Habitat for Humanity, they're a nonprofit. They're not taking anything off the top as profit. And uh, they'll work with people who will ultimately own their homes. And it's pretty well known that home ownership helps people keep stay out of poverty and helps bring up the area as a whole over the long term. Um, so I think this is a case, I mean, it sounds like Habitat has a higher bid, but still sounds like a case where it's more than just money here, um, you know, and a chance to do something that helps bring up our area. Um, on the other hand, you know, if the borough does decide to go with Simron's uh, bid, um, I would like to see there be a requirement included in there that the property be used for either low income or Section 8 housing. Um, and this, you know, like I said, uh, we heard the term market rate several times, which would mean that these properties would just be going to whoever the highest bidder is. The market rate is ridiculously high right now. Um, I don't think we need to just be squeezing out more and more of our... Uh, um, so uh, that's about it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments from the audience? I saw Brad's hand first. <laughs> Hello, Brad Chambers, Columbia Borough Council candidate. So, I understand that you have decisions to make tonight, and so either way you go, you know, it's ultimately going to be up to each of you to decide what's best for Columbia. This is just my thoughts. So, I purchased uh, a personal home, and I have purchased uh, a commercial home. So, I, I know, uh, and I'm heavily, I follow the, the real estate market in, in Lancaster County. It's, it's been booming for the past two to three years, so that's one of the reasons why I'm here. And the market rate for a two-bedroom in Lancaster County is anywhere from like $1,400 to $700. So I think the question that you need to ask yourselves is, are you doing this to increase revenue for one party, or are you doing this to enrich the lives of multiple parties? So which do you care more about? The, the personal cash flow, or do you want us to see people who didn't have an opportunity to get in that position get there? Because trickle down that economics, it, it, it does not work. You know, you can see how that went in, in 2008. So 
And uh, I am curious if uh, you want to weigh in on this, uh, Mr. Murphy, but if you're doing four to six, what would the floor plan look like? Because that's that's a lot. Uh, I think the mayor said in the past that he wasn't interested in seeing high rises due to the drone project. So I'm not sure how you would do that. But I would be interested to hear it. And those are my thoughts. I, I think I, I lean with Heather on this one. Thank you. I think there's a lot of assumptions here. Um, yeah. Number one, that only one person benefits from new market rate housing downtown, which is not true. In fact, the idea is to bring as many people to the downtown area as possible to make all businesses in the downtown area flourish. Uh, it's not about one person making money. It's about everybody in the borough, a rising tide to lifts all ships. And that's what it's about, it's a revitalization. What happens when the tide goes out? <laughs> oh no, what does happen when the tide goes out? I guess the tide goes out for everybody. Just like everything else in the world. When the, when the economy tanks, everybody suffers. Nobody's insulated. That's a, that's a ridiculous response. Oh, yeah, that's a happy phrase. We're not doing that. Yeah, okay, so more people come into the borough, they live here, they use the they use the amenities, the services, the shops, the people, the pest control, the grocery stores, the eateries. They use the private schools. Uh, they contribute to the borough, and they contribute to everybody in the borough, as well as the property owner paying property tax, which also contributes to everybody in the borough. So I think that's a very narrow-minded view, um, and I understand what you're saying. I think it's also kind of short-sighted to assume that the houses that are going to be for sale through the Habitat for Humanity proposal are going to be cheap. That's what you're assuming. You're assuming that market rate rental properties are going to cost more than a house or a home that these folks may build and put on the market for sale. Did you ask them what are your houses going to be? What are they going to go for? What's going to be the market rate when you sell the house? Your mother will lose properties be fifteen hundred dollar a month mortgages. So I think it's very short sighted. You guys have these these arguments that don't make any sense. I'm sorry, I'm not answering your question. You, you said participate, so I'm participating. Thank you, Council Person Bedard. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know, as a person who pays taxes and who owns uh, commercial real estate, that uh, no, it is it is definitely about personal enrichment. It is the easiest way to leave your tax bracket. Well, not easiest, but it's the most reliable way to leave your tax bracket. And if if that's what you think needs to happen here, that's fine. It could be. It could be that what you're saying is true. Then that's fine to say that. Yes, it could be. Hypothetically, it could be. But in most cases, that money goes to one party. Maybe that's not true, Mr. Murphy. I don't know. But I'm, I'm just saying, in most cases, the money Here's goes to one party. What's wrong with someone making money? Here's what I've seen, Mr. Murphy. Multiple locations downtown. This real estate ventures and his commercial properties. He's taking people who were disadvantaged. People who have no other options, no other choices, no other way to, to live their dreams. I can think of Cafe 301. Uh, right off the top, I can think of other people who started out over here that he supported. Uh, how about the, the wedding dress shop up the street in the old Northwest Bank building? I think that's a Russian immigrant, yes, who wanted to start uh, her own business, couldn't make it happen. She's a gifted designer, couldn't make it happen. What Mr. Murphy did? He invested in her shop. He set her up for success. He built that place to her specifications. He marketed her, as he did with 301 Cafe. What was her number? What was her name? Laurie. What was her name? Laurie. 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 Now she has a thriving catering business. Yes? Based on the efforts that Mr. Murphy invested in her. How about equipment uh, pharmacy? Right around the corner here, 400 block. He's from what? Uh, Uganda? Nigeria? Uganda? Uh, so, uh, well, well, Hitler, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Listen, you don't want to talk about this. I'm sure it's close to him. You should, sure know a lot about all of this. I've been in the mirror for a while. We're not going to. You know, I've been in the mirror for a while. Here's what I don't like. Here's what I don't like. Nobody, nobody's here to throw stones at people. Right? Yeah. And you were just throwing stones. I'm not throwing stones. 
I was calling out. I was calling out your argument. But I've seen people on this council and in this town throw stones at people because of personal grudges and personal politics. What's wrong with that? We're not going to throw stones and we're not going to do personal I stopped what I'm doing. You asked me about the beginning. So, so, so you asked about does one person, does one person benefit? Yeah, I've seen multiple business owners who never had a chance well, benefit from the investment. Since he seems to be such a great charity, I'm sure there's no qualms with making it, requiring it be low income property. All right, it would fit right in. We've already said we cannot put deed restrictions on, and that would have to be a deed restriction. There's no way we can do that. We've already said that. Um, I'm, uh, I'm good. I'm not good. No. no. Thank you. And then we have Frank's hand up. We'll get you in, Frank. Keep it track. I forget what we'll say. Oh my goodness. Get out. How much did the borough pay for this property? Seventy-five. Seventy-five. Yep. Well, I attended most of the meetings when this was talked about. Uh, And I kind of thank council for following through with us and trying to get the highest bid. But I think the real person here is Sharon. Sharon is the one that spoke up and said, why are we taking this loss? And he just went on and on. And it are apparently well, maybe with what we're trying to learn, we won't think on gain a property. But I have something I'd like to say, but I'm not going to. Thank you. Boston, correct? Yeah, uh, Michael Boston. Um, I think this is actually a little bit more simple than I was making it. It comes down to what's best for the borough and what's going to be best for the long term of the borough. And not only will Cimarron bring in more revenue and make it a more desirable location, I think the argument that it won't promote home ownership is false. I think you want young people in their mid to late 20s, early 30s to come to this town, fall in love, and want to stay here, buy a home, create a family. So I think if you really want to grow this community, grow this borough, you want to have more shops, more apartments, you want to bring people into this area, and you want them to fall in love with it, and then they'll buy. So you want to change that. I remember Austin from before, but before we go for the votes, is there anyone else from the audience that would like to speak? All right. Anyone else from council? Any last words? All right. Next. Okay. So I have. A, Action item 12B, would anybody like to um, motion to approve the offer from Cimarron Investments in the amount of $60,000 for the purchase of 400 Oak Street from the borough? Uh, I have a motion by Council Person Kaufman, second by Council Person Bergard to approve the offer from Cimarron Investments the amount of $60,000 for the purchase of 400 Locust Creek from the borough. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Anyone opposed? No. no. Great. That carries. So that's the zinc and Whitner, no. Yes. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> not, not, about the, not about the purchase. About how we handle the purchase. Um, I have your answers. Do you? Yes, I do. Is it sunshine that we have to purchase? I didn't see it in the sunshine law. It's, it's one of the amendments. Yeah, the, the newer amendments to the sunshine law make it pretty clear that if you are, if there's any kind of exchange of money going on, the public has to have notice of that ahead of time. That's what you're asking. But does it have to specify the amount? As far as I, the way I have interpreted it, yes. Because to me, um, not so much on selling the property, which I would like to ask that question then, but um, when we go to buy a property, 
First of all, it takes two weeks of minimal for us to make a decision on it. Mm -hmm. Not a very minimal. So if I brought them big, if I if I propose today three eight hundred square mm -hmm. then I'm gonna buy a property for one hundred twenty thousand dollars. That gives everybody in the world mm -hmm. two weeks, mm -hmm. two weeks and three days to raise that price. Mm -hmm. I understand that. And I don't think that is what the government is saying. Well, so, as part of the Sunshine Act, right, you have the ability to go into executive session to discuss the purchase of real estate, right? And for that exact, um, what I'm not sure that they realized when they passed the recent amendments to the Sunshine Act is that it, to make any decision on that purchase, right? You can discuss whether you want to purchase a property or not purchase a property or what might be wrong with the property or what's right with the property in that executive session. But in order to make a decision to purchase the property for a specific price, you have to do that in an open meeting. And now you have to publish that agenda with that information at least 24 hours ahead of time. Whereas before, you could literally, you had to have the agenda put up on the door at the time of the meeting and you could hand out copies to people at the meeting. Right. You guys do it, you know, the packet comes out further in advance. You, you go above and beyond what the Sunshine Act requires. Well, that's my concern. Yes. And I don't mean that smartly. I'm not yeah. talking about mm -hmm. hiding anything from anybody. Yeah. By me. Mm -hmm. To me, it's, protect, it's protection of the world as well. Yes. Um, I did not, and, I, and if you can, these four B the amendment you're talking about. Okay. I could not find it anywhere where it said about hanging the brush. I will I will get that to you, Eric. Please. Yeah, please that, yeah. So my question to Jeff as a realtor. Um Jeff, obviously by this is a slight big board here, you make more money, so that's irrelevant. But can you tell me if To me, it feels wrong that we waited five weeks on a published number to make a decision. Can you tell me if that is uh, in the real estate law? If that is, and it, to me, it's definitely morally wrong, but ethically, does that violate anything? Well, uh, first of all, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not going to give a legal opinion on anything. But, but no, I'm not no. I mean, I always <laughs> have an attorney. I'm asking, obviously, you're a broker. Right. I, I, I have certain ethical confinements. I'm bound by confidentiality. So, and I acted as a dual agent in this transaction with both buyers. Right. Okay. Which was, it, 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 it's not difficult. You just can't tell either party what the other party's doing. Right. Uh, however, in this situation, I found that both buyers maybe were aware of what was happening in the transaction, not through correspondence with me, but through others. And I think based on your attorney's uh, information that you're not bound by the same confidentiality duties that I am now. So right. that, that, so as long as I'm being ethical and I'm following my obligations, well, no, I'm not I, I'm, I, I know you're not. I, what you do is up to you. I, you know, I can still do my job. Not interfere with my job. Okay, that's what I want to be sure. No, just and, and I just gain more information from my clients than what I gave them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and is there a time limit that you can hold an offer? Well, as you notice, both these offers ask for acceptance by tomorrow. So technically, if you wouldn't make a decision by the end of today, tomorrow, they could withdraw their offers. They, they wouldn't have to fulfill that that offer okay well i'll so, go back to the first offer it's the same situation you, you didn't make a decision so that buyer did not have to stay in the agreement they elected okay. to stay in the agreement okay you know, and i think we were fortunate that that happened because we ended up generating two offers both of which were higher absolutely yeah thank you well that's, just, that's what happened to us the last time was the one offer requested um acceptance before council had even met. And so we went back to them and said, can you extend it because we're not meeting to make that. Okay. I just didn't want to put you in jeopardy. I, I appreciate your concern. I'm a big boy. I can handle it. No, I understand. <laughs> I, understand. I just didn't know 
and it was conflicting and everything else. But I, like I said, I, I did do some research on the Sunshine mm -hmm. Law. And I didn't see any example where that was the price. So, thank you. Thank you. I didn't want to have that discussion. Oh, yeah, no, that's okay. Because I, I asked him when I came in. And, so. um, all right. Well, what do we have to do now with 12C? There's, I mean, by virtue of accepting the offer in 12B, um, you are, you really don't have to take any action. I think probably um, the best thing to do would maybe just for the record purpose, a motion rejecting the offer in 12C just so that's not hanging out there. And that was what I was wondering. You can make a motion to reject the offer based on the acceptance of the previous offer. Yeah. Yeah. That way. It wouldn't be conflicting. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. But I don't really want to vote to reject the offer. So what does that do? You I don't. You can vote no. Yeah. Do I have a motion to reject the offer from Habitat for Humanity in the amount of $60,500? And the second. I have a motion by Council Person Regard, a second by Council Person Fisher to reject the offer from Habitat for Humanity in the amount of $60,500 for the purchase of 400 Oak Street from the borough. Okay. Can I say something? Yes. I don't necessarily agree with that motion. Uh, I don't think we should reject the offer. There's technically the offer's dead. I, I can see you really, you know, making a motion to pass this, but that puts people, that can put people against, you know, I don't want my name coming back in six months saying, I'm against Habitat for Humanity. Here, look at this. Well, you rejected the offer. It doesn't mean you're against yeah. the organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, still, it's still rejected. It's yeah. still rejected. Yeah. 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 If we accepted the first offer, <laughs> then the property is not for sale. Therefore, the process, that offer is not even valid. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I don't feel like we need to vote on it. I, I can see voting to eliminate moving from the 10 d but or whatever it is, but. I, I, I would say at this point, then, because you accept the first one, I would simply say you can move on the agenda, the other, other offer is not going to be there. All right, that's not a motion, then, Marty. All right, so then we're just not taking action. Yeah, you're right. That's fine. I appreciate that, uh, Council Person Hoffman. I know there was some heated discussion over what might seem like a silly topic to some, um, and this is by no means a. Uh, um, is that? Yeah, of Habitat for Humanity. Um, great organization. Um, we're going to get together with me and learn more about it. Uh, it's a matter of what who was a better fit. So, right. moving on. Um, next, do I have a motion to approve change order number one? For the Second Street CDBG project. Who was that? Yep. Um, okay. No, we're, we're not doing this, gentlemen. Please. Gentlemen, I said, gentlemen, please. We are in the middle of a meeting. I have a motion by Council Person Stahl and a second by Council Person Price to approve change order number one for the Second Street CDBG project. Um, this is there's no change in cost or anything. It's just amending it to change the um, the wage rates to comply with Davis Bacon that was um, recently updated. Um, can you ask them to turn it down out there? So we can close the door. Yeah. Or close the door. I don't like closing the door though because it's, it's an open meeting. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have any questions, comments, or concerns on the change order? <coughs> anyone? 
anyone from the audience? Third. I have a motion by Council Person Stahl, second by Council Person Price to approve change order number one for the Second Street CDBG project. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Yep. All right. Next, um, could I have a motion to authorize the bill payments? Okay. Okay. A motion by Council Person Price, second by Council Person Stahl to authorize the bill payments. Questions, comments, or concerns? Is that um, on page two? It says Marlowe's S is something this is journal for 299. Is that an annual chart? Yes. Yes. Are there any other questions, comments? That is paper we get weekly, and I do pass it around. Okay. I just wondered if it's sand going on. Yes. And then also on page seven, um, I was trying to, it says revenue in the middle there. So that's something that's going to, then we, on the expenditure page, but it says revenue um, on page seven. Okay. That was, where are we looking at? 620 oh. Wall Street. And that would have been return of appeal fees. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and it comes out of revenue account just like this one. Okay, I didn't get one because that was a pretty I usually, I usually um, flag that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good luck. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got that wrong. That is return of double payments of taxes. I was going to say that. Yeah, that's, that's not a real piece. Yeah, because I had that. I usually mark <laughs> that. Yeah, I didn't catch that one. Yeah, that was a, double, a duplicate tax payments. Is what that was. Yeah, sorry about that. Thank that's you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And then um, page eight. I was okay. just wondering where this was installed. It says burglary fire system. So the the security system has installed here on the borough side. It's a lack of a better term, a panic alarm we okay. have here that, that that's very nice. Okay, thank you. Great. Any other questions, comments, or concerns on the bill payments? I vote motion by Council Person Price, second by Council Person Stall to approve the bill payments. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Next, we have new business. Um, we have a certificate of appropriateness from the applicant, GK315 Locust Street Apartments LLC, care of uh, Cimarron Management to install a non illuminated commercial business sign with State Farm logo and dimensional letters and window and door vinyl signage at 305 Locust Street. Um, Heather, we have um, yeah, four well, RPM signs here as well. Yeah, and I um, do want to note that because it didn't say it in the executive brief, this was approved with no conditions by far. Um, does anyone um, want to <coughs> discuss, question, or make a motion to approve? This is probably needless to ask, but it does follow on your sign ordinances. Yes. To approve? Approve. All right. I have a motion by Council Person Stall. Do I have a second? I will second. Uh, I have a motion by Council Person Stahl, second by Council Person Zink, to approve the certificate of appropriateness uh, from the applicant GP, GK 315 Locust Street Apartments, LLC, care of similar management, to install a non illuminated commercial business sign with State Farm logo and dimensional letters, and a window and door vinyl signage at 305 Locust Street. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. I'll sign this one now, just so I remember. Could I ask a question about this paper? I just was curious about what that, um, the letter of authorization that's in here for the signage being April 3rd. Was that for the sign? On the building or the vinyl? On the building. Okay. 
Okay, because that I just wondered because that was signed and all before quite a bit in advance of the heart application. So I just wondered that. Thank you. All right. Um, next, we have a special event application from the Merchants Association to host the Discover Home Bruise, Bourbon, and Brews event on Saturday, September 23rd, 2023. Do you have any questions, comments, or concerns on that? Well, the executive brief was pretty uh, self explanatory. to shorten it this year um, and run it September 22nd and the 23rd on Friday and Saturday. Um, and as I said, as I say in my um, pamphlet there is that uh, we want to kick it off with a um, band from Bobby Gentilo, he's um, a local artist here in Columbia. Um, and then, um, have a bourbon tasting, a beer and wine tasting, a cornhole tournament, and anchor it with the macaroni and cheese festival that was um, very, very popular last year in Silver. Um, the last page was our um, PR statement last year that we released, um, and it goes over how many people came through town and um, what our numbers look like as far as merchants were concerned. It was a, a huge success, um, but I think that on top of that, it really brought the community together, um, and we want to grow the um, Macro Energy Festival, or I should say the Macro Energy Festival. The map um, is for clarity reasons. Um, Pam Arnold um, asked me for um, a clear specification. Uh, the stage is proposed to be put right here on 3rd Street and closing off 3rd Street from Locust to Avenue I with tents along um, in front of the market house um, and then anchoring, anchoring it at the bottom where um, Lanco smokes is since they are the host of the um, cigar rolling event and he flies that guy in from the Dominican Republic. The guy did the um, seminar last year. It was a huge event. Um, it was standing room only. Um, I know because my husband was there. <laughs> and the bourbon event was um, quite nice. Um, our own Eric Kaufman was there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I know that um, the uh, majority of the concern was for the um, the alcohol aspect of the event, and um, we will run that exact. I, I ran the beer fest for the Chamber of Commerce, and we are going to run it exactly as the the Chamber event with um, armbands and um, drinking glasses. The drinking glasses are five ounces, um, and we will have uh, wash and rinse stations, and um, we're only going to have three um, breweries um, and two or three wineries. Um, the Lancaster Distillery that has moved into Columbia um, also does bourbon, so they have um, been contacted for their bourbon as well. Any questions? No, but one suggestion, if you're doing the mac and cheese again, <laughs> make sure that you um, label them for allergens. My son was this close I know, I ran. to anaphylaxis <laughs> yes. because there was there was crab in this and it wasn't labeled. So it was labeled, but um, 
Yes. Yeah, if there was there was nothing to tell him that it was crap and yes. so I like dove at him because he literally was right here. Daisy, it says here that there will be two police officers on site. Is that included in this seven hundred dollar uh, cost for the borough? I'm assuming that's what that is. It is. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for. I know you met with the chief. Yes, I did. Uh, but what streets are you expecting to shut down? Just third and safety lane. Third from Locust to Avenue I. Okay. And I, well, I know you're going to map. The stage is going to be here. Correct. At the corner. So I almost act as the barrier to the rest of them. Correct. Wonderful. Thank you. So now I understand. I'm going to try get this. We talked before about for profit and paying for the cost. Where are we at with that? Well, Mac is not a non profit, so we don't have cash. So, so yeah. we absorb the seven. Yes. Yeah. So I just want to make sure I understand that. Thank you. And just like the other things, once it's all done, we will make sure that we see how close we were until we get a better idea of. The actual. Um, I have a question. Um, I noticed on the executive brief, I saw this earlier and I completely went out of my head to think about adding it. I only have one motion on the agenda, but there are two motions on the executive brief. Do, um, because there is a motion to waive Chapter 77 article uh, on open containers for the event. Um, but it's not on my agenda, and so I'm not quite sure. So, yeah, that one. yeah if that is not on there, then council would need to, to vote to add that to the agenda at this time, if you'd like. All right, so we can do that now yes, and not at the uh, No, you don't necessarily part. have to do it if you can. It. It's nice if you guys have that for that, but it's not necessary. You know me, sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, do we have any uh, questions, comments, or concerns? I missed the seven hundred dollars. Where is that? On the executive brief at the bottom of it, below the motions, it says the approximate cost to Columbia Borough will be approximately seven hundred dollars. Are there any other questions, comments, or concerns? Well, we do have the PDF office on page 71. I see that. I see that. Um, take action on this this evening? I don't have to help you. Yeah, I don't either. Um, if we are, the first thing I would like to do is get a motion to add a motion to the agenda to approve waiving Chapter 77, Article I, Open Containers for this event on Saturday, 9-23-23 from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. We add that to the agenda. Second. I have a motion by Councilperson Kaufman, second by Councilperson Price to add a motion to the agenda to approve waiving Chapter 77, Article I, open containers for this event on Saturday, 9 23 23, from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. That is now on the agenda. We will consider that as item 13B1. You didn't vote. I know we didn't vote yet. I'm just saying it's added to the agenda. Um, does, does anyone have any questions, comments, or concerns on that specific motion? That part of it? Yes, Frank. When you make the motion on waiting the alcohol, is this just for that event? Or is this for the borough? Well, that's what I was going to ask and say, can we add that to, to the motion um, to say that this 
waving the open container is only for Third Street from Locust to Avenue Line on and Saturday, Sadie Lane on, on, that date. on their Correct. states. Yep. Yep. It's yep. not for everyone. It's not a free for all. Correct. Yep. Okay. So my concern is somebody wonders from this event, how does that relate to that person? Or if What's they are outside of the event, then they will be cited for open container. We have officers, they're going to be here, okay. so if they leave, okay. I'm sure that they will tell them, okay. if you've got an open container here. Just, I don't um, understand. Yep. yep. All right, since this is, oh, I'm sorry, 13B1, um, we'll do 13B first. I know, but we're going to do 13B first. And you have to vote by adding it to the agenda. Oh, we haven't voted to add it to the agenda. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> All in favor of adding this motion to the agenda? Aye. Uh, uh, anyone opposed? All right. Thank you for keeping me straight. <laughs> okay, so now we have uh, agenda item 13B. Do I have a motion to approve the special event application from the Merchants Association of Columbia? to host the Discover Columbia Blues, Urban and Brews event on Saturday, September 23rd, 2023, closing 3rd Street from Locust to Avenue I and closing Safety Lane. Second. I have a motion by Councilperson Kaufman, second by Councilperson Price to approve the special event application from the Merchants Association of Columbia to host the Discover Columbia Blues, Urban and Blues events. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Next, would anybody like to make a motion to approve waiving Chapter 77, Article I, open containers for the Discover Columbia Blues, Urban and Brews event? On Saturday, September 23rd, 2023, from 12 to 8 p.m., only in the areas of Locust Street to Avenue I, or, or no, 3rd Street from Locust to Avenue I, and Sadie Lane from 3rd Street to Market. Is there a motion? Second. All right, I have a motion by Council Person Kaufman, second by Council Person Price to Approve waiving Chapter 77, Article I, open containers for the Discover Columbia Blues, Urban, and Blues event. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. Okay. Say it again. When it's not one here, I should remember to keep it all the same. <laughs> All right. Well, there we go. Another good event coming to town. Thank you. All right. Next, we have. Uh, could I have a motion to approve the hiring of Kathy Mary Ritchie? Yes. As part-time, uh, ten to twenty hours per week, crossing guard for the Columbia Borough Police Department. Second. I have a motion by Council Person Price, second by Council Person Kaufman, to approve the hire Kathy Mary Ritchie as part time crossing guard for Columbia Bird Police Department. Madam President, yes. I know here under operating expense, yeah, expenditures for uh, 23 24, those amounts are incorrect. I, I thought yeah, that 23 was like should be about 3400 and then 24 would be uh, 6,600 or yeah. thereabouts. I thought they looked really high. I was like, whoa, I'm going to be crossing the water. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? One I, I apologize. I did not ask if we wanted to vote on this tonight. I figured this was an easy one. Sorry. $17, friend. 17, $17 now. Do you want to park that down? No, thank you. Are we at full map? No. <laughs> we'll never be. I know. Yes. We'll never be full map. <laughs> All right. I have a motion by Councilperson Price, second by Councilperson Kaufman to approve 
hiring Kathy Mary Ritchie, Ritchie as a part-time crossing guard for the Columbia Emergency Department. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Right. Next, we have a contract with Rue Environmental for the River Park Phase 3 Historic and Environmental Clearances. Um, I understand this is part of what we have to do to satisfy the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, which we knew was one of our permitting things. Yeah, this came up in our um, comments, initial comments from the Army Corps. Um, <clears throat> at the time, just so council understands, we did do our due diligence here. At the time we reached out to A.D. Marble, which is who prepared the original clearances for the 462 bridge project, um, what the what the Army Corps is looking for is they're looking for us to do some investigation into any historical either structures or artifacts that could have existed there. However, there is an exemption. There's an exemption that exists if the land has been obviously disturbed which we know that this area has been heavily disturbed over its use. So, 80 marbles quote was in the range of $13,000, which was robbery in my opinion for what we need here. Um, Rue Environmental is going to do some test pits and basically write a memo to talk about the history of the, of the area. And that, we are hoping to get us a free, so. So those are the two that looked into correct we again we, we thought ab marble would be simple since they've already done all of the work down there uh, we were hopeful uh, we were hopeful through this process that the phfc was going to accept all of the work that was already done for the 462 bridge and area around it's a very very detailed study that was done so this kind of surprised us that they were looking for anything from us but they wanted a supplemental study done and again we went back to ab marble who did the original one that was that's an insane cost so um Rue environmental is who we have out on the Innis site and so far um been impressed with his work so i thanks for explaining that because i wondered how we decided to yep yeah when i kind of got the quote from Navy marble i reached out to dave Ray and what can you do for me yep any other questions? Yes, there. This is phase one A of phase three, correct? <laughs> yes, if that's <laughs> I, Barb, I don't know if we've officially named them all, but yes, this is this would be the first part of phase three. Right. And we haven't really committed to a you know, a move forward ahead with phase three yet. Correct? No, this this work is under the it, it's nearly a year ago at this point that you authorized C.S. Davidson uh, to work with land studies and acquire all of the permits needed to do the stream restoration and install the eventual culvert crossing. And, and our plan at that time is to get all of this stuff in the works and permitted so that when grants become available to do it, we are in a position that we can apply for them and, and, and get them. And if by any chance we have to close the contract, Will these studies expire? Uh, I don't believe the studies will expire. We need to work with Army Corps and DEP once we hit once we pull the trigger on submitting the permits. We need to ensure that if those permits are issued and we're not ready to move, we can work with the the state and, and Army Corps to extend those, but we have had success doing that in the past. Yeah, are there any other questions, comments, or concerns on this? No, I think it would be in our best interest part to have the have the utilities and have done as soon as possible and hopefully we can secure some funding for that. So that that's done when the uh, when the bridge work starts. Because we don't know we don't think they're going to use phase three, but we don't know for sure what's going to come out there. And uh, and I sure wouldn't want to run some heavy equipment over that call point right now. Yeah, at this point, full full disclosure, at this point we're in a little bit of a holding pattern with phase three until PennDOT lets the bridge project and the contractor is awarded. Um, you recall we did provide uh, some right-of-way agreements with PennDOT through River Park. The, the thing that's unknown right now is what the means and methods of the selected contractor for force two broad project is going to be. Uh, that area could be a big staging area with cranes and whatnot there. 
for two to three years, or it might not be heavily used. We don't know. So what our intention is is to continue to move phase three of River Park forward, at least the stream and culvert improvement end of things. And then once the contractor is established for PennDOT, we can have a conversation and understand what our window is to be able to get in there and construct. And hopefully it's sooner rather than later, but if it is later, then, then we'll put a pause on our efforts to make sure that nothing we do is damaged by that. Has the bridge gone out to bid yet? Not yet. December? Is no, I thought they were putting it out to bid this spring. The project now, the project delayed because of the shift to study and analyze the U.S. Oh, 30 grid. Right. So they plan on letting the project late summer or fall of this year. Yeah, they're now talking 26 or 27 to shut down the bridge. Right. Mm -hmm. it's it, 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 yeah. So it's it's moved five years. All right. Are there any que other questions, comments, or concerns on this one? Um, do we want to take action tonight? Um, I, I can say, do we have a motion to approve the contract with Rue Environmental for the River Park Phase Three Historic Land and Environmental Clearances for four thousand six hundred eighty-one dollars? Second. I have a motion by Council Person Stahl, second by Council Person Price to approve the contract with Room Environmental for the River Park Phase 3 Historic and Environmental Clearances for $4,681. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. Next, um, we have a request to have Borough um, have staff work with the engineer to prepare and submit subdivision plan to subdivide approximately 26 acres from the borough owned property at 254 Blue Lane. Uh, again, this is the property across the road from where we, the borough farm. from the borough farm, let's say it's the borough farm. Yeah. What most people think of as the borough farm. And again, this would be in preparation to sell the property. Questions, comments, concerns? Would anybody like to make a motion to authorize staff to work with the borough engineer to prepare and submit a subdivision plan to subdivide approximately 26 acres from the borough owned property located at 254 Bloom Lane? Seven. You want to second it? All right, I have a motion by Council Person Stahl, second by Council Person Kaufman to authorize staff to work with the borough engineer to prepare and submit. Subdivision plans subdivide approximately 26 acres from the borough owned property at 254 Blue Lane. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Next. Um, we have to consider the appointment of Solanco Engineering Associates LLC as the official sewage enforcement officer. Um, as stated in the executive brief, our sewage enforcement officer has retired and her role we have to have one um <laughs> so because we do still have some lots that have on-site um, septic so we have to have a sewage enforcement officer um there's no financial impact to the borough of these costs because they are all passed on to the individual property owners any questions on this? Yes. Um, so, is this organization just going to do the old system, or if there's a, a sewer line replacement, they will do the inspection of that? Only for all my septic service. Okay. That's what will continue to do inspection of replacement. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Now, it's test here. Staff contacted a few other businesses that provide the service. Were there we don't have any to compare though. No, it's just the only one that came back with a solid offer that we okay. to that. Did, did you get I don't want to phrase this. Are you aware of any other municipalities using their service? Yes. And the the reason this all came about is um Marv Stoner, who has been the student enforcement officer here in Lakes County for probably forty forty years. Um he has now retired. So there was a um, several emails that around all the people saying, 
all those who use Mars Stoner, what are you doing? How are you filling the gaps now? And um, several, of, that's where I pulled the list of names from the people I talked to. Um, I, I will say, I first went to Derek, our pro engineer, and Derek, after looking at it, respectfully declined. That's not a service they want to maintain and pursue further. After talking to Derek, then I reached out to a few others and said, hey, is this a service you want to do? Um, I have worked with Mark Daimler in the past. He's now with um, Slanko. He covers mainly the southern end, um, but he is more than willing. He, he covers Millersville Borough, and they're in a similar situation, which is only a few lots. Um, he covers a couple others in the area as well. So we got to him. He provided his sheet and said he has the capacity to handle us. So that's our race. I think they may also be in right yeah, they're in Riceville as their zoning office. Zoning office, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Sure. Oh, I thought you had a question. Well, as some just rang about what he said about them. I know not being in Riceville. I think I did read something about that. Mm -hmm. All right, are there any other questions, comments, or concerns? Does anyone want to make a motion to appoint Salento Engineering Associates LLC? As the official sewage enforcement officer, I have a motion by Council Person Stahl, second by Council Person Price to appoint Salanco Engineering Associates LLC as the official sewage enforcement officer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Next, uh, this goes hand in hand with that. We have to amend our fee schedule to include the fees for the online septic system that would be passed on from Salango. Uh, so do I have a motion to adopt resolution 2023-20, amending the 2023 fee schedule to include the new fees for online sep on lot septic system review and inspection services. I have a motion by council person Stahl, second by council person Price. What? Nothing. Keep going, Stuart. <laughs> to adopt resolution 2023-20 to amend the 2023 fee schedule to include the new fees for all not septic system review and inspection services. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Any more opposed? Can I question that? Yes. <laughs> the fee, you're changing the fee to what they charge per hour. A change into their uh, their approved 2023 fee schedule for Salento Engineering, so that our fees match theirs, so that ours are just pass through fees to them. Yeah, what, what I'm getting at is, would it be better for the borough to stay out of this and just have them charge someone for that? I don't know. Or, 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 or as far as I or, know, or should we add a couple of dollars to it because we're going to do the administrative? Enough? We don't, we don't do that with the administration. We connect them up. They contact them directly as part of the, uh, their application. If they don't them. pay, we're on the hook. I don't think so. I think in most cases, you would not get a permit until you have paid that. Yeah. Mayor, it would be the same exact system that you have right now with plan reviews that I do is when the land development plan comes in, I will review it. I build the borough for my time. The borough pays C.S. Davidson and then gets reimbursed by the applicant as part of the close out of the permit. I'm just trying to get around some middle man. Yeah. He's a middle man for no fee. That's what I'm getting at. We do have a, an application fee as part of this that we do collect for part of their I saw that. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. That, that answers the question, yeah. right? Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Are there any other questions, comments, or concerns on this one? I have a motion by council person. Wait, did we remember this? Yeah, yes, we did. We did. We did. Yeah. The mayor went out of order and he's got me all confused now. No, you didn't answer very comment <laughs> questions. I'm all confused. <laughs> you did the bamboozle. All right, next. Um, consider the agreement of sale for the purchase of 9.4 acres of land located off Ridge Avenue for 1.35 million for the purchase 
for the purpose of relocating the Borough Public Works facility to this location. Um, we've talked about this in executive session. Um, this is purchasing the whole acreage and uh, we would decide from there if we wanted to subdivide pieces off and sell it or you know any of that information or any of that those decisions would be later uh, but this is just agreeing to the uh, sale having that signed you want to vote on this tonight or are we are ready to pull it uh, we talked it, talked it, talked it. Talk it. Well, My question is still I was just going to say, I'm ready to go on. Mm -hmm. Get it rolling. I don't mind voting on it. I just was wondering, I, I can't remember what the discussion was about that, but if there was one. So, so, what, what did, why are we paying more than we assess about it? Um, like, who paying the This is actually less, less than, than the appraised value. Right. right. Look what it's assessed at. Yeah. Well, so the assessed value is, at least in most cases, I don't know when the last countywide assessment was done in Lancaster County, but I'm guessing it was a while 2016, ago. 2016. 2016. Yeah. So the assessed value tries to bring that up to whatever that date is current. And then after that in Pennsylvania, because it's not reassessed every time that a property is bought and sold, they have what's called a common level ratio. And so the fair market value of the property is supposed to be whatever the assessed value is times the common level ratio. Um, since, I mean, you see what has happened in the real estate market since 2016, right? Um, and so that's why it will be more than the assessed value, or more than the, yeah, more than the assessed value. This, yeah. the, this person only bought it a few years ago. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think it's important for the public to make the council too. I know. I was going to say that too. To put together how this is going to be paid for. Oh, no, that wasn't what I was. That was what I was thinking. <laughs> so close. I know. So close. Yeah. So far away. Um, in the executive brief, in the um, in the packet, it spells out that the funds. Um, will, for the purchase will initially come from the uh, Wells Fargo money market account, um, which will be reimbursed once we sell the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the front 137 Front Street, which is the old uh, firehouse, plus selling on Blue Lane. And then if we subdivide off um, Bridge Avenue and sell portions of that, that would also go back in. and. Uh, we stop the the fund, the capital fund. Um, yes. But I also think it's important to note that this, um, Frank, your concern was getting the public works over on the borough farm, um, and do we really want to go up and down that road and blah blah blah? Um, but we did our study, and it would cost about five million dollars to locate our public works out there. Out the road. Out of Blue Lane. On Blue Lane. That was one of my questions. So this is significantly cheaper, and it gets our, our public works guys right in the middle of town, <laughs> basically. But they're right here, um, so it would be it would be a win win. There is already an existing building on that property. While it's not great, the bones are great. It would need reskin and re um, new yeah all the whole skin all around, plus um, utilities redone. But even with that work plus the purchase price, it's still significantly less than the cost to relocate out at Blue Lane. The other huge plus for this is that there's already uh, public utilities on the site. If we went out to Blue Lane, we would have to do some site utilities, and which would require maintenance. Um, we don't have that here. We're hooking into public water and sewer. So. But I think it's important, that, as you phrase it, Madam President, the end result of the real estate transactions in in the works will be to a positive side for Columbia Borough. Yes. So that Columbia Borough taxpayers are not going to flip the bill no. for this transaction. No, and it's all coming from the capital fund, which is not directly your, you know, the, it's not the same as the general fund. Um, but yes, 
you're right. Ultimately, it is going to be a positive because the cost of this is what we're selling just um, what would be both the parts of the wastewater plant. But even just the section of the wastewater plant that we're selling now and the firehouse is more than what this is going to cost. And we would more to develop. Purchase right? initially. To purchase initially. Yes. yes. The building is going to need some kind of work. Right. So that's why. Uh, do we have any estimates for that? We, we do. We, we estimate, and, and these are based on cost estimates we got from the current owner. He had looked at doing major renovations to that. To His, his business wasn't like ours, but the the configuration of the building and the set out of the building was similar to what we're looking for and that came in just under two million dollars so we rounded it up to about two to clean up the site fix it and so the purchase price plus the renovation costs are less than the sale of all four of those properties so those four are needed for just the purchase is the purchase and the development of the site and if all those as we plan, then this will be a um, we will have to generate more for the sale of all this and within the cost of buying and developing the site. And this location is connected to a property that we already own. That's the site of the, uh, the, cell, the cell tower. So that I mean that's pretty good. And if we are looking to subdivide a piece off, it would be about five acres. Um, so I mean that would be. That was affecting this additional revenue as well. Um, so, good deal. I don't know what we can say as far as what went on in the executive sessions, um, but as much as I think this is a great opportunity for the borough, uh, it, it, um, for the works department especially, uh, New Central in North Columbia. Um, there was issues, uh, access issues and stuff like that. I really want to see a package deal. Uh, not necessarily us make one purchase for everything, but have all our ducks in a row to agree to it. I think what I can say here is that with us not you know, not having gotten to the point of, you know, author, you authorizing us officially to execute this agreement of sale, our ducks are in a, as, as in a row as they can be. Without, and without, without, you know, we weren't going to obviously move forward past making sure we, we knew what we could do without having an act, without you guys actually approving this. So they're but, not completely scattered, they're organized, but not in a straight line. Yeah, yeah. The ducks have all been accounted for. Or just so, yeah. But they're just <laughs> waiting for this to be pulled, cool, this right. trigger pool, and then they'll. And we'll, exactly. That's so we've done all cool. the due diligence to secure the access. We're just working with the current property owner to determine the best location of that access. Did we get a discount for any fire damage? <laughs> <laughs> so, no. again, this price is not included the access. No, it is not. And I, I feel much better voting on a motion that includes both the access and the private way. Because right now, we don't have access. And I don't want to, you know, you know what I can't say. Right. Um, but uh, I, I can't speak for that. I was just some people are okay voting for it. I'm not comfortable voting for it right now. Okay. I'm in favor of it. It's not comfortable with it right now. Yes, Frank. Can I ask a question first? If all the ducks were in the road, I still stay the same. We, we, we're going to pay additional funds to secure the access. Okay. How can you all sit there and say this isn't costing the bird anything? They're not, no, we said they're it's, not, it's not coming out of the general additional. Form. They're not costing any additional funds. Somebody had to buy the firehouse. Firehouse, who bought that? Well, they're in the process of buying it. The the CEDC is no. We 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 bought it originally. Uh, yeah. Right. So we have money in it. So it's not going to cost us any additional money. I what I meant was out of the general fund. Yeah. 
Yes, but it, it wasn't said. Uh, I did hear the thing, nothing about environmental studies. It's not even in the book. We we know what's there. It's already done. It's already done. Who who did that? The, the environmental study, Frank, was done several years ago. Uh, this parcel is under what the state calls an Act Two remediation. So <laughs> the, all the environmental studies were done. There's test wells out there. The test wells have been monitored consistently. So we we have contacted DEP. They are well aware of our potential interest of acquiring this. Um, they've looked at it. We actually had ECS, the environmental firm, that's doing the work out at McGinnis. Just to look over our shoulder, use their expertise to check and go through the Act 2 documents. They checked it. They don't have any concerns with it. So we feel like no additional studies are needed because the property has already been studied and is currently being monitored by the state. If, if you're safe with that, yep. I would like to know more about the access. You might open the can of worms. I don't want to. <laughs> the current access to the property it crosses the stream and it's actually on someone else's property. Oh. Um, and there had been an easement granted to the to an owner of the Ridge Avenue property to use that bridge over the stream. The stream, the, that access road is currently severely deficient and not safe for anyone to even walk across it. Um, and like I said, it goes across someone else's property. So. That's what the that's what we mean by the access. Okay, I just wonder. Was what that too much? No, because that's, 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 that's all yeah. yeah. I just wonder what you're getting into with that. If you buy it and don't have an access, and you can't get an access, is there a way of in the backside of coming in from I don't know where that goes to? Is there a possibility for that? So let me, let me say this, Frank. Now, we, we've looked at that coming the back way. We looked at that coming off the extension of Lunston. There, there could possibly be a way to come through there, um, but it'd be a little more expensive. The bridge to get across that culvert would be more. Um, what we're asking for right now is to enter into an agreement of sale, have a due diligence period, and before council actually authorizes the sale. We will have everything else secured and locked in. We just need this to enter the formal negotiations with their team and their attorneys to then begin the acquisition process. So before you guys actually have the next vote, which is to spend the money, um, we will have all the good deals done. Which includes access, everything the neighbors, neighbors to get the access. The and I'll call it the Kaufman package. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I kind of know the property. So I walked the property. Did council, the council walk the property? I did. I was on that. Yeah. You know, that I, would, I would think anybody that's open should walk it. And I am not against that. No, I agree with you, Frank, but I was not invited to do that. I don't remember. Well, there was, there were questions with the the current I mean, owner. Technically, um, technically, no one should be walking the property. Correct. <laughs> if you if you step foot I on did. that property, you are in violation of the MP company, which I is did. why. I took the yeah. <laughs> I understand. The, I'll say, well, well, yeah, that's that because the portion of the yeah, portion yeah, yeah. yeah. of. Oh, yeah. I do agree with him though. If if we're voting to purchase something, it does make sense to actually see it and to see what we're getting. Because I I'm just taking everybody's word of it. I have not mm -hmm. seen it except from the road or whatever is visible. I think your access of five million to even for them to win there. I think you're you're correct. It might even be more. But the outfit going down to to. Uh, right. Down the road, the blue lane there, that was just, I, I could not believe that you have been thinking about that. Uh, I'm halfway thinking about this because it has other possibilities. Well, right. I mean, there's there is a lot, there is a lot of possibilities there. And it already has, um, um, what do you call it, trunk work, loading knobs. And stuff like that. I and think all need to redone. Yes. You need heating, well, right. heating system and right. everything. Yep. And garage doors. Mm -hmm. uh, how much are we getting for the sort plant and the highway trip? We haven't closed those sales yet. We haven't closed those yet. Yes. Yes. It's, uh, this is not being made on 
guesses or uh, estimates just pull out of nowhere. We have a study that was done. We have the former documentation from, or sorry, from the current owner as to the estimate to do all of those improvements to that building. Mm -hmm. And so all of that's in hand. Um, I'll say we don't need to, we have had access to all of the documents and layouts of that property. Um, so as far as like having not seen it, um, we have our engineers review that we have all been briefed on before, prior to this meeting, prior to this decision. So I don't see it as a as a lack of information or preparation for this decision tonight. Um, the one question I would have is for, to answer the access issue is if, if we would, for some reason, not be able to gain access, are we able to back out of the agreement? Yeah. That's the point of the new okay. yeah. here. So yeah. I don't really see it as being an issue that is negligible on the side of council to decide to enter into this because that's what the due diligence is for. And it moves this process along. And it's been a, a year in coming of just a lot of work and study on behalf of our team here sitting to the right of me. So. And it wasn't just Eric. There were other members of C.S. Davidson yep. in, in the different engineering fields that we're looking at it and everything else, and our public works have looked at it. Um, My personal opinion is it's time to keep this thing moving. Yep. Get a get big in a public works facility, and also this is what ends the sale, complete sale of our wastewater treatment plant. Kind of helps push that. Yep. Yeah. Maybe you can straighten me out. Heather, the alphabet that Bill Clerks in Georgia. CEDC. Yes. yes. Wasn't these properties put in the hands of them to sell? Yes, those two, yes. How can you do that? If people don't get in there. No, because, because as, as a government entity, we can give it to the CEDC to sell to get the highest and best that. offer. But what they actually do is we signed an agreement with CEDC to say we want X number of dollars for, these prop for this property. And we give that, they signed that. So they are going to give us that money when they sell that property by what was our date, July. Yeah. So then, okay. when they so then they do what they do an agreement of sale with the owner of that property. Well, who's um, in what's there? Your question? What's your <laughs> I understood the way this passed the meeting that they were going after other buyers. That's the, how can you grab for other buyers? And they said, well, they don't have a contract or something. Can we go out there? Just because someone has a lease on a property doesn't mean that you can't sell it. So that's, they can, and they, they would, you know, sell. someone else, if a different person bought it, and they had advertised, I think, to to anyone who would be interested, mm -hmm. um, you know, they would buy it subject to the, you know, you would buy it as a commercial investment property, essentially, if that's what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know. There's a tenant in there. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's what they would end up doing. Fair and they long. have how many year lease? At the 20, sewer plant? 29, I believe. 29 wow. year lease at the yeah. sewer plant. So it, it, they would come in with a tenant that's going to be there for a long period of time. Yeah. And we were good on money. Mm -hmm. So you're saying we have money to buy this property uptown. Uh, if they have this lease, how are we going to get our money? For the well, we sell it. Well, we sell it. To when we sell it, we sell the lease and they take it over as owners. So yeah. the sale terminates the lease agreement. Yeah, if, if the tenant were to buy it, that would terminate the lease agreement. We were to buy it, but if they did, if they just keep releasing it, we never get our money for the building. Right. It, it's a calculated step yeah. in the process. Yeah, but, it's so, yeah. but someone else could buy it. It boils down, we don't get yeah, somebody who's up to, to buy it. So it boils down, we don't have the money in hand to buy the property at Fifth Avenue. Well, that's we're exactly saying what it says in the in the have it. We're not going to deal with it. It's our new tax better. But, but I still, I, I think the building is what we need. The, the land, I like the nine acres, uh, and you can do other things with it. But boy, it's going to take money. Yep. Mm -hmm. So everything else does too. No, exactly. 
All right. So, would anyone like to make a motion to approve the agreement of sale for the purchase of 9.4 acres of land located on Bridge Avenue for $1,350,000 for the purpose of relocating the Borough Public Works facility to the location? And a second. I have a motion by Council Person Stahl, second by Council Person Regard to approve the agreement of sale for the purchase of 9.4 acres of land located off Ridge Avenue for $1,350,000. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. All right. And next. So no, right? Not an eye, but a no. Okay. Correct. <laughs> um, oh, this wasn't on here when I approved the draft agenda. Um, we have received the formal request from the Lancaster County to see if we are willing to work with them to develop a watershed based stormwater management plan. Um, and Mark would like authorization to work with them on that that is not committing us to the plan it is committing us to discussing to see if we are interested in going that way they the planning commission the planning actually the planning department is asking all municipalities in Lancaster County to uh, if they're willing to com come to the table to talk about a plan for this again not approving the plan it's or committing us to working with anyone just committing us to talk to people. So the end goal is to have a countywide 167 plan? Yes. Absolutely. And to look at each one as a subwater basin and, and do stormwater regionally instead of <laughs> side by side. Right. And, yeah, at full line. Right. Kind of makes sense. Yep. Yes. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to authorize staff to work with the county? For development of a watershed based stormwater management plan update. Mm -hmm. and, and I have a motion by Council Person Regard, second by Council Person Kaufman to authorize staff to work with the county for the development of the watershed based stormwater management plan update. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Any more All right. Uh, staff reports, comments, and announcements. Solicitor Gable. I do not have anything else to add on there. I think you've heard enough about what I've been doing for the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, Secretary Treasurer. Thank you. Um, we had a proclamation earlier about the EMC days, EMS days. I just want to say that the borough was honored to be able to host them this morning, um, have them come through. We had almost 20 of the Lifeline staff come through here, um, sit, sit around and talk with us. Uh, I think a, a highlight for many of them is we all found out that we have dungeons in the basement of the market house. So <laughs> we gave tours of the market house and we got to see that and it was it was an enjoyable time, but it was honestly an honor and privilege to, to be able to celebrate them and all the hard work that they do. So thanks for that. Um, reminder that our offices are closed this coming Monday, Memorial Day. And finally we the staff um, met with Penda a um, week and a half ago, I think it was to discuss some details of the 462 bridge. What this involves is um, they're going to need to cut the guide rail along 441 right by the bridge in order to enter the site there to get to the one um, pier. Um, there, there was a, an ongoing question as to whether the borough officially vacated that, which was Front Street for the 441 relocation. Um, we didn't find any documentation that it was formally vacated. So they wanted to make sure the borough is okay with them accessing that land um, just temporarily to get in there and look and, and do some work on the, on the pier. So we, we think it's, it's, it's appropriate. Um, it was interesting that Norfolk Southern was very guarded about allowing PennDOT to access their land, and they have a lot of rules and restrictions on, on how PennDOT can do this. So this takes one of those peers away from that process and allows them to access it right up 441 without 
obstructing traffic to get to it. So um, they will be they'll be getting in there soon. They'll have all the safety things in place, but you'll see for public see you'll see them accessing that that one pier right off 441 right there um, in that site. So the, the project is still moving forward. We meet with them on a fairly regular basis to discuss it. Um, Chief and I and others have had several meetings to talk about the emergency response um, during the construction phase of this, and we'll continue to move that forward. That's all I have. Thank you. Question here. What? When is the 462 bridge going to start? Um, there, PennDOT is supposed to sit <coughs> out the contract this summer. They'll award the contract probably by the fall. Once a contractor is hired to do that work, they will then establish the timeline, means, methods, and how they're going to do all the work. So until a contractor comes on board, we won't have details as to when the actual construction piece starts. I thought it was moving ahead. It is. And this is part of the moving ahead. They have to get through all these steps to do it. What year will this start? Um, we believe that the contract work will all be completed this year. Um, mobilization and staging will probably take place next year. The phase one of the project is to get underneath the bridge and do work, so the bridge won't be closed during that. So we're hoping that starts in 24 or 25. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, and I noticed that Engineer Ronaldo is not on here, but he is here. Did you have anything else for us? No? Not a mess. He gave his update last time. Just All right. Short this time. Um, boards, <laughs> commissions, and committees. There are no, um, no more meetings to finish out this month, and we did not get any um, approved uh, minutes. But I did have a question. Do we know where we're at on the Maple Park project? We got that grant. Is What is that? Because we're, we're not hearing anything from Parks and Rec. Thank you. I just added to my update. Um, this week, I received all of the signed, approved, fully executed um, contracts and agreements for the grant. The next step, um, Derek and I have talked about, is we have to put out an RFP to get a consultant to come in here and help look at that. Uh, we'll get that out the street here soon. Um, get a consultant selected then to oversee the project as a whole. Of and movies in the park, are we having them this year? Yeah. Because music, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I know we're having music, but movies normally we approve the expenditure to buy the movies, right? <coughs> they, are, they are scheduled to see the license. The thing is, no one's reached out. We haven't gotten any information, and we got to get on that. We haven't applied for any movies. No, we have no. We got to get on that. So. Somebody needs to let me know because they got to pick which movies they want.